Okay, councillors, if I can encourage you back to your seats. Am I on? Okay. Going to get started, and we're doing Ricky. One, two, three, four. Oh my God, I'm losing people. Right, what's Be Rebecca? Becca. Have you got those handouts? Yeah. Oh. Okay. One, two. Is that seven? That's seven. Yeah. Okay, councillors. I apologise, but we're going to we're going to get started. Martin, Ryan, Mark. We are going to get started, and you make a quorum. So yay. Let's do that. <laughs> so um, we're going to make a few adjustments to the agenda, having confirmed it as was before, uh, just because to accommodate some flights and some visitors. So and we're going to go in this order with your leave. Are you all in favour that I make a few adjustments? Thank you. Um, we're going to go with the community occupancy policy because Ricky's on his way to Wellington on a plane shortly. And then we're going to um, take Jason and, um, and uh, Jeremy um, around the Gallagher Performing Arts Academy in the theatre because they're here. So with your leave, we'll proceed that way. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, elected members. Uh, this report, which is uh, item nine, page 43, starting. Uh, seeks the approval of one of two options uh, following the scheduled review of the community occupancy policy. Uh, the two options reflect a staff view, uh, guidance out of the last elected member briefing, which was in November, and uh, feedback from the community groups uh, following consultation. Option A entails a single tier policy with an 87.5% rental subsidy for all groups, which is consistent with the status quo. And option B entails a two-tier policy where a group that has more than $2 million in revenue, a uh, surplus of $100,000 left over, and also get financial support from central government would receive a lower subsidy of 50%. Um, and all the other groups that don't meet that threshold get the 87.5%. And that's in response to um, the guidance at the last elected member briefing in terms of having a two-tier structure. Both option A and B include the ability for commercial activities to operate and incentivise the community group to operate the activity themselves when able to do so. Both options also include revisions to the policy and guidelines in response to any requirements within the existing policy, such as updating the market valuation rates uh, to give effect to the purpose and principles of the policy and to further improve plain English readability and ensure consistency with other council policies in terms of look and feel. Uh, both the policy and guidelines have been reviewed by a city solicitor and um, uh, my colleague Karen here, who you may or may not know, uh, welcome any questions. Okay, we will take, oh, hang on, sorry, let me just get to discussion. First up, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
thanks for the report, and, and I'm really pleased to see the two-tier structure um, as an option there. On page 60, halfway down, there's where it describes the um, the criteria for the for the um, second tier. It, there's an A, B, and C, and so the first one is that a group has a revenue more than two million. The second is a financial surplus, 100k in the bank. And the third is that it, it receives central government funding. Is, is there actually a need for that third one? I mean, why are we why are we um, why are we asserting that that should be one? I mean, uh, there might conceivably be organisations that have that amount of dosh, but aren't aren't getting government funding. They may be getting it from somewhere else. Or yeah. So the, so the rationale behind um, receiving central government funding was just to respond to. Uh, the concerns that were raised out of the elected member briefing, apparently one of the elected members um, felt that if a community group is receiving uh, support from central government, then they should be considered in terms of uh, second tier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just questioning why all three... So, so the that has to be because you know they, they may be getting their money from somewhere else. Absolutely. So what uh, staff did is we went out to the community groups themselves and said... Uh, would you would you believe that the uh, rental subsidy should stay the same, which is 87.5%, or do you believe that there should be a different subsidy for a group that's earning more than $2 million, or a group that's um, getting to keep $100,000 in terms of their surplus, or a group that has or receives uh, central government funding? So how staff have uh, responded in terms of the recommendation today is by suggesting that if you are able to tick all three of those boxes, then you'd be considered for a, a different tier, which is a 50% subsidy. And that's on the basis that it provides a holistic uh, view because a organisation that may be earning more than $2 million in revenue may not be uh, left with a surplus in excess of $100,000. So that's a staff attempt to provide a full picture um, and obviously, if, if elected members feel otherwise, they have the ability to put up a motion. It's just our staff recommendation. Thank you. Do we have organisations in our who are um, leasing these properties that are that have that sort of money and that sort of money in the bank, or that sort of revenue and that sort of money in the bank, but aren't aren't receiving central government funding? Uh, it's, it, is, it is actually quite difficult to determine whether a community group is receiving central governing, government funding or not, uh, only because uh, in terms of their finances, we would have to uh, go through them and actually uh, differentiate if the funding is from central government but or we not. But we must know who the big are. Oh, yeah, we can certainly identify uh, in terms of the total amount, and there are some that are very obvious in terms of receiving central government funding. Uh, but in terms of some of the other community groups that might be earning more than $2 million, uh, we would still need to make an assessment on that community group at the time of their financials as to whether they're receiving central government funding. Mm, okay, thank you. Councillor Mallett. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, on page 47, paragraph 49, the second... The second bullet point down, it, so this is additional changes to the policies and guidelines out below, uh, outlined below. So obviously these are things different to the rental subsidy issue. The second one down, addition of staff ability to amend guidelines in the policy. Um, the reason you bring these things to us is so that we can set a policy, Absolutely, so yep. approve a policy. But you're wanting some delegation to be able to change the policy later on, eh? And so in, in terms of that, I perhaps could have written that a little bit differently. Um, it's essentially saying amending the guidelines, so the, the changes in the policy in relation to amending of the guidelines. So the policy we can't touch, that's a, a governance decision. Uh, the, all, the, all the guidelines do is give effect to the policy. So they, they're not going to, there's going to be no decisions which are made uh, that are inconsistent with the policy itself. Okay, can you... Is there a page here that says the guidelines? You mean with... 
Sorry, are you asking you want to the, where the actual guidelines yeah, document yeah. is? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's on page 85. <coughs> so it's attachment five, page 85. Okay. Thank you. I will feverishly look through this yep. and then come back to you in a second. Absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Um, it's, it's a tough thing, isn't it, to, to get the timing right of a true financial position of an organisation, I take it? Correct. Um, so, for example, you know, if someone's uh, $100,000 in surplus, regardless of, regardless of whether they bring in $2 million or $20,000, um, how did you mitigate that? Did you, or was it just at one point in time? Yeah, so in terms of uh, assessing, it was just to assess on their most current financials, but obviously the financials that will be relevant at the time is when the lease comes up for renewal. Yeah, OK. All right. No, cool, thank you. Um, and of the slightly cheeky and uh, what a challenge that we supposition we put up before, um, of those respondents who overwhelmingly wanted to keep it the same, do you have any indication of um, how many in that higher category wanted to change to a two-tier system? Um, unfortunately, I don't believe we did an analysis in terms of uh, differentiating <coughs> who, the respondents were. who the respondents were necessarily. Is that correct? Um, so, <coughs> the so sixty two percent wanted it to stay the same at yes. eighty seven point five. Thirty eight percent. Hang on, sorry, could you say that again? Sixty two percent wanted it to stay the same. In terms of status quo, so 87.5% subsidy for oh, see, all sorry, in terms yeah. of rental. Yep. Um, so the other 38% were a mixture of those that supported one of the options in terms of a two-tiered structure, whether that was... The way we um, asked the question was whether they supported um, large organisations by saying large organisations that are over 100k surplus right. or you know, central government funding or revenue over <coughs> two million. Yeah. Um, so it's staff's recommendation where we actually combined the three factors. Okay. Okay. No, that's all I got, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just, I guess with your leave a little bit, I just wanted to perhaps re-ask some of those questions I asked you, Ricky, just for the benefit of other members. <coughs> um, point 37. Um, when you talk about the current portfolio revenue of 127,000, is that that's the total revenue stream from the 100 plus community leases we have? Yes. Yeah, so, so currently, uh, obviously, the amount is 127,000. So, with the uh, the rent review, which is a requirement of the current policy to re review the rents every three years, the amount changes. If everything was to stay the same, at one hundred and forty-nine thousand. Okay, so that sorry that that's irrespective of this tier option, isn't it? That's just yeah. So if if you were to um, keep the status quo in terms of the eighty-seven point five percent rental subsidy, then that's the amount that you would expect, all things considered. The one forty-nine. Correct. One hundred and forty-nine thousand. Okay, thank you. Um, also, just regarding. Um, if we went with the two tier um, in terms of the 50% subsidy, the actual increase in net revenue was quite marginal, wasn't it, you were saying? Yeah, the, the increase is marginal, yeah, that's correct, yep. Um, and potentially at the moment it was about only three that would fit into that. If, if you were to do the assessment today on the finances, but again, it's it's only an, it's only indicative because finances move all the time, yep. then there would be three that would be definitely in that group. Okay. Now, I've, I'm being careful. I'm not trying to paraphrase what you said or, or be leading, but I got the impression that option B, because I understand this process to be one that uh, is equity across community organisations, those that have more funding. Um, it's not to increase council revenue. It's not the purpose of it. So I got the impression that option B, for marginal increase in income, created a whole lot of extra work by staff in terms of <laughs> ascertaining if these organisations... Yes, that's because uh, with the 87.5% rental subsidy, there's no need to make an assessment of the financials. So each time 
there will be the renewal, there will need to be uh, staff which would have to go through the lens of having a look at the financials to determine whether the revenue is over two million and if there is central government funding. So, so there is more administration in that sense. And then each one of those comes before the full council, doesn't it? Let correct. Members. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Gallat, um, Councillor Mallet, that was a transposition of your <laughs> name. <Councillor> Gallat, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> That, That's right, that Councillor Pelsgate. It's a <laughs> spooner, spoonerism, isn't it? <coughs> yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I've now feverishly looked through the the what Brilliant. do you call them? Guidelines. They are so they are fundamental to the policy, aren't they? The, the guidelines give staff the direction in terms of how to apply the policy. So the, the policy is at a strategic level. Um, yeah. The guidelines are equivalent to what we might have sitting behind all of our policies, but not necessarily written, if that makes any sense. So the policy might be something like that uh, council uh, provides community leases that are, uh, enable non for profits lease a property where they wouldn't already be able to say. There's a very windy and well un, un, unarticulated policy. And this, and this is behind that to say, so that's, this is where the market rate comes in and those sorts of things. Yeah, so even, even the market rate is in the policy. So the policy actually locks in the market rate um, and, there, and also the, the subsidy. So all of those things are locked in in the policy. It just says, the guidelines just say, look, this is what staff are going to do in terms of uh, putting up the recommendation to council okay. to approve a uh, occupancy agreement. Now I'm really disappointed because I've realised I've just feverishly read the old guidelines and there are some, the, read, the new ones are here in the red, aren't they? Is that right? Uh, the, the red is the track changes here. Yeah. yeah, so I've just, I've read Sorry. the wrong one. Sorry. Okay. And, okay, so just to further complicate things, this this document that was previously called the Community Occupation Occupancy Policy is now being crossed out, and it's now called the Community Occupancy Guidelines. No, so the community it was originally it called the community. No, it was originally called the Community Occupancy Policy Guidelines, and we just called it the Community Occupancy Guidelines. So that, that's just the guidelines. Oh, okay. So yeah. we haven't. So taken it's all out. relative to the policy. Okay. Yep. Right. There's two documents: yep. the policy and the guidelines. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, I'm just okay. I'm just concerned that um, there's stuff in the guidelines that's that strikes me as being reasonably uh, substantive. Um, all, all the decision making f functions uh, in terms of the approval of the lease, they, they all sit in the policy itself. Okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Hamilton. Okay, question for. Um, Lance, apologies to put you on the spot. Um, I understand this, this recommendation is, is all about equity. It's not really about financial for council. That was, am I correct? Yeah. Um, so I guess my concern is if we go option B, which potentially generates more revenue, but it's going to cost more council time and energy to save 30 grand, um, but it gives us that, it means we can tick that equity box a little bit further. Where is where would your leaning be on these options in terms of the best efficiency for council? Uh, well, probably Karen can answer that question because she's she's got to administrate this. And if you want to get an indication on how much extra time is involved, um, I just want to remind councillors that my recommendation was that you didn't review these guidelines. That we thought 87.5% was actually working quite well, but. Elected member said you wanted us to have a look at <coughs> equity around some of those larger organisations and that sort of thing, so we went away and did that. Um, but Karen, I think um, with the work that's been done, I, I suspect in our conversations that there isn't, um, once we bed this in, there isn't a whole lot more time, is there? Because basically we've got the policy and guidelines there, there's just a bit of work around looking at those financials and those sorts of things when the applications come in. and. Correct and also their annual reports and that sort of stuff. So, but Karen can probably clarify that further. That's correct, isn't it? That's, I think that's... Yeah, so we obviously were, um, we think the 87.5 is working well. Um, yeah, there is potential an argument for 
um, it is could be seen as more equ equitable in terms of charging those larger organisations or giving them less subsidy. Um, so, the, I mean, the way we've looked at how we would apply it is the most, I guess, pragmatic approach for us with the least amount of of administration where we apply it upon lease application. Otherwise, it would be far too administra administrative to yep. implement. So therefore, this way, um, it wouldn't be um, too cumbersome for staff to go down that track by just applying it upon lease application. But it's not like we've got 15 operators up out there at a commercial, so it's not, we haven't really reached, got a th high threshold to trigger a change necessarily. No, and, and the other thing I suppose to add is that um, staff don't necessarily have the, the financial uh, nous in terms of making those assessments, so there will be um, there will be discretion on staff's behalf to actually make the assessment at the time. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, just a Can you give me an example without breaching any commercial sensitivity of who our bigger ones are? Are we talking like rugby... Uh, that sort of thing? Are you, are you suggesting in, in terms of... Uh, oh, we're talking about these, these ones who would be affected by a, by a two-tier system. You can yeah, so um, they, are, they are generally regional groups. Uh, they are, some of them are national groups. So the, it's, it's consistent with what you would think in terms of a group that's earning more than $2 million. It's mm -hmm. not going to be your local rugby club or your local volleyball club. So who have we got in those? Uh, I can, places? I, I've got a list here, we can send it around if you like. We've made some copies if you want to see the specific yeah, uh, groups. it would be helpful. Yep, yeah, we can distribute well, that. You just tell me if you like. Oh yeah, um, while, while they're being distributed, I'll also uh, run through them. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's right. thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, we, you're you're being handed out the groups that are receiving um, in excess of two million dollars in in terms of total revenue. Uh, you'll see that some of the surpluses are more than a hundred thousand, and some aren't. So, as I suggest uh, suggested before, it's at the time of the renewal that you actually have to look at their financial position. This is only their most recent. Uh, right. So, so Ricky, what I'm seeing here is okay. So there's one with Waikato. So are you you're talking about the Girl Guides and the Scouts as a national collective bringing in that revenue? That's their financial position, or is it just the local branch? So the national bodies hold the actual lease. Right, ah, I see. Yeah, so that's it, and that's part of the tricky part. So I these see, are the yeah. financials for their national body, and therefore Scouts and, um, you know, ha have a large amount of revenue because it's a national, mm. a national body. Okay. Okay. And, and some of those groups don't necessarily differentiate at a local level. So yeah, it would yeah. be, and that's the point I made to uh, Councillor Hamilton around staff needing the financial nous to actually um, wade through the finances and make an assessment. Well, like, couldn't they just <coughs> submit that information? And, and that, I know with, um, with Well Trust, for example, we had a similar issue with regards to funding. Um, and we just made it, they had to statutorily declare what was you know, their local position. Yeah, and, and uh, we can certainly request that as part of their um, renewal application to suggest that it, if you can do as best as possible to uh, differentiate it on a, a local level or, or a regional yeah. level, then we can certainly make that request. Really subjective question here, but um, uh, if you had asked that beforehand, do you think this would have looked quite different? Uh, you know, the, if you'd asked their local position rather than their national position? If, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, with this table, for example, the Scouts Association of New Zealand, you've got about three or four scout groups here. But if we looked at it locally, would it be, they probably wouldn't even be on this list, would they? If we looked at it locally, we're not too sure. Again, I suppose that's the question that we would have to make that yeah. assessment at the time. Yeah, Yeah. I guess, I, guess what I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to find out is comparing apples with apples and, you know, is it, is it worth it? That's what I'm doing. Yeah, and I think, yeah, you're, yeah. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of um, being, able to, <laughs> being able to apply the two-tier structure robustly. Staff have just done the best that they could do mm. um, to put up a proposal to meet the expectation of the elected members. Yeah, OK. All right. Thanks, mate. Thank you. A question for me before we go back to Councillor Mallett. Um, 
So you are, if, if um, there is favour for option B, this is to be assessed at the time that the new lease is renewed, the release period. That's so correct. what is the average period of lease for was, these places? Yeah, so un under the policy, I believe uh, a maximum of 15 years is the, uh, the tenure for a lease yeah. upon renewal. Yeah, so that's whether in, um, if it's just a land lease, group mm -hmm. owned building, um, if they're in a council building, it's a maximum of 10 years. Right. So it can be anywhere between 5 to 15 years, correct. essentially. That's correct. Um, so it's possible, therefore, that an operation that one year is just under revenue or surplus may, and even the ones that are not presently on this list, may grow in strength and attract... A windfall fund from government, for example. Correct, yeah. Like, they may, they may they have some... They could then come into that category for their next lease. Yeah, they may have a, a really good couple of years and then a really good bad year. So that was the intention of making a three... Um, a three-pronged test in terms of the tier, because essentially you're saying to them that this is the subsidy that you're going to be living with, so we want it to be very high mm -hmm. in case, uh, if, if there's a suggestion that you're able to hit all those marks over a, over a period, then um, you're probably a large enough group. Uh, isn't it reasonable also to say that <coughs> organisations that attract government funding, quite often their government funding is contingent on local support, whether that's in the form of re reduced leases, uh, financial contributions, local donations, whatever. The government sometimes does not get involved with a charitable organisation until they're already robust. That's, I mean, that's probably a fair point. So that that's one one um, that question was me was with me then about the and, 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 and government assistance rather than an and, or, or something like that. But because I think you might, we might end up accidentally penalising someone who works really hard to secure a significant government grant. Yeah, so as, as I say, like it, it's to have a very high um, test. Um, they would still have to have more than $2 million in revenue and $100,000 in terms of their surplus. Mm. as well. And can you just remind me, because I can't remember who generated the request for this work. So I think there's two parts, because I'm still, and I'll come back to that in a minute. My other question will relate to the um, commercial aspects of any given site. But where did this um, request for this to come up come from in the beginning? Just remind I'd, me. I don't think, it, yeah, it was definitely the councillors. I can, I'm, I'm very sure about that. Uh, in terms of the specific councillors, uh, there was no one particular uh, elected member that had a view on how to go about a, a two tier, but there were okay. more than one, there were more than one elected members that um, felt that it was worth looking at the option of a two tier structure. So I don't think there was any particular elected member in isolation. Well, Jeff's pointing to himself, so I think he's part of it. But <laughs> that's fine. Look, um, it, we came through a work, <laughs> it came through a workshop, didn't it? As a sort of, um, you know, is there equity over the community leases? It was driven by that whole. There was lots of discussion. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yep. I don't think it was that much discussion. But anyway, um, in in terms of um, just to, I think I heard you correctly. I just want to check I did. In terms of the quarter reduction for a community, uh, for a commercial aspect, that's in both. Yes, absolutely. That's so, correct. So if you go for A, if we go for A, um, we will still have that quarter reduction on the commercial aspect. That's correct. Yes. Thank you. That's, Thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Um, just uh, community outcomes plan. Yes, yep. Okay. How, uh, that's, sorry, that's page 100, 4.5. So you're recommending a change because by the look of it, there has been something called a community outcomes plan required in the past. Correct. And you're just changing what you want them to do. <coughs> Is that right? So I, I think that's, I mean, the intentions, not, none of the intention has changed in terms of the community outcomes plan. So the policy still acknowledges the community outcomes plan. So are you on a page um, 100? Yeah. Just might look for the clean copy of the guidelines. Uh, well, I'm just looking at what changed. It's really only um, some wordsmithing around clarity for the community outcomes plan. So do your community groups do an, an annual community outcomes plan? 
So upon their lease application, that's when we set up a community outcomes plan with the group and it forms sort of part of the agreement we have with groups in addition to the lease or licence. Um, and then we use, we use that as and when required to monitor or when we um, are working with groups to talk about their outcomes and their activities in the community. So how does that differ from just them coming to you and say, I want to lease this, or could we please lease this property on a community lease? We're a bowling club, we're a rugby club, we're a pottery club, we're a bridge club, we're a... So, uh, so uh, basically the, the staff work with the community groups to, to determine the community outcomes plan and the purpose of that is to ensure that the direction that the occupancy group are taking is consistent with the direction that council want to go in terms of our strategies and plans and other things that we having, have going on at the moment. Like for example the, um, the town, the Western Town Belt, if that was in place. Okay. Um, on page 103, you've taken out so, um, so I, I think it's paragraph 5.3, it's a bit hard to... It's the, it's the paragraph that starts off with council subsidy. <clears throat> and you've crossed out the 87.5% subsidy. Correct. So that's so that the... Because that's in the policy. Yeah, it's correct. That's in the policy. So um, that's so that the guidelines are consistent with the policy. So if you were to adopt either policy, the one with the single tier or the second tier, the guidelines would be consistent with that. Right. And because there's becoming tiered with commercial activities or the 50% um, the tiering, then that's why they've taken out the 87.5% there because there'll be different subsidies for different groups. Okay. That's, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. And you talk somewhere about, and I've lost it now, about um, commercial activities. Um, so most, uh, most sports clubs, bowling clubs, rugby clubs, tennis clubs, etc., do reg you know, part of their ability to stay afloat is that they run a, a food vending and tip and very often um, alcohol, liquid, you know, liquids type vending. How does that fit into this? So the, the essentially the uh, previous policy gave no guidelines around how that would fit, uh, and and so staff were told you know to consider that well. Uh, were acknowledged when staff brought that up um, and that's why they've been provided in the guidelines and the policy around what would be deemed as uh, consistent with what the uh, permitted uh, activity might be for that particular group. So it's about ensuring some sort of consistency so that there are not commercial operators taking the advantage um, away from the community group from having that occupancy. Yeah. Okay, so it would be up to a staff member, a member of the staff, to say, we think ABC Tennis Club is just a front for a pub. Uh, so a staff, the staff member will, if it is a, a community activity which is run by the community group, then the staff member apply the criteria as to determining whether it's appropriate or not. Um, if it was a community activity, if it was a commercial activity which is run by a commercial entity, then the staff cannot um, can only make a recommendation. A council have to approve that. So that you elected members will have to approve that. So just to add to it, we our intention is to try and be more enabling of um, some of these commercial activities that we have. Um, in community occupancy spaces where we think they're appropriate. Put my glasses on, I can see you. So, you know, hence why we've put some minimum requirements into the guidelines there that actually give us the ability to do an assessment and then make a recommendation. So our intention <coughs> is to apply this going forward and therefore when we bring a lease application to you for consideration, we would include in there what, if there's commercial activities at that site, we would include in the report what those commercial activities are and our assessment against the requirements here that we have in the guidelines and making a, making a recommendation. Okay. Currently, and I'm, I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure, currently every uh, community lease comes to this um, committee to get approved or re re renewed and that yep. sort of stuff. Will that change? No. Okay, so 
all that will change is that the measurements by which you make your recommendation to us are changing a bit because you're changing the guidelines. Yeah, so the, the, there's no change in terms of um, what would come to council around the approval, but now we have a, a mechanism to say, hey, look, there's a, a community group that's doing this. Um, they've got a bar or something like that. We we believe it's a commercial activity. Um, this is what our recommendation is in that in relation to that, and then you get to decide whether you agree with that or not. How would you make that distinction? Because for a community... The more, typically, uh, the more successful a community group is, the more it become, more it looks like a commercial enterprise. So, I mean, we determine it being a commercial um, activity by being an activity which is uh, n not a not-for-profit activity, if that makes any sense. So, it's it's but a for-profit. Then you want profit. them to be sustainable, though. We, we they, pretend we want them to be sustainable, but you can't make a profit. Correct. So, no. So, we're enabling the commercial activities uh, within the parameters of the guidelines and the policy. Um, to ensure that there's consistency with what that group is doing because we don't want to have uh, community occupancy arrangements where there's 10 cafes on a uh, one of our sports grounds which are there for the purpose of making the club very sustainable but there's only five members. Mm. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you. I'm happy to move A. Okay, have you a seconder? I'll second. Um, okay, no questions. Um, Councillor Gallagher. Yes, sorry. No. Forgive me, and I apologise if you if this has been covered before. I'm just holding this sheet of paper up here, and as a relative new councillor, I'm sort of somewhat quite amazed. At, can, can you just quickly? I'm amazed at the dollar sign. Too. Well, no, I'm amazed at the the, the 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 Just quickly describe. I mean, obviously, prior to council, <coughs> I'll get a picture, a descriptive, you know, what what exactly the the land footprint is. But you're saying that these community groups obviously sit on our. That's correct. They these are community groups that currently have an occupancy arrangement with council. So just quickly go through where these properties are, if you wouldn't mind, and, and I'll get through Lance, and I I should have. Sorry. Well, I, I'm just intrigued. I'm, I'm just intrigued about what, um, because you know where we talk total revenue, uh, is that the total? Is that a site? For example, Life Unlimited. Is that? Yeah. I'm just interested. Is I explained that before. So the yeah. total revenue is for these organisations. Some of them are national organisations. Yeah, yeah. They might have leases in Christchurch, Invercargill, everywhere, and also in Hamilton. So, and we talked about that before. How it's difficult for the team to actually with these organisations no, is to no. actually define what the revenue is within the Waikato or the Hamilton area. So um, if you look at their current rents, um, their footprints, in my view, would probably be relatively small. So the Order of St John? It's their ambulance what? building up in Rotatuna, is that oh, right? Oh, okay, okay. That, that's, no, that's no, it's the no, one at Seddon Road. It's one at Seddon Road, it's is it? Yeah. So how so much is Seddon Road? Sorry, what's the question? What premium? size? Well, obviously, I will take the St John's Trust, for example. They have a, quite a huge footprint at Seddon Road, but obviously we don't own all of that. It'd just be a bit of it, I assume. And I do apologise if I'm exposing so myself in terms of lack of... The, uh, the Order of St John's, so there, the size of the site is... 2,020 square metres. So it's a land lease only. So obviously where ah, groups mm. have a land Leasehold, lease so yeah, it, yeah. only, yeah. their rent is a fair bit cheaper than one that's in a council that's building. The, that's the difference between leasehold and, and freehold. Uh, so it's, uh, we, we have, as council, we provide... Stop laughing, council. Uh, we provide land and all buildings. And that situ in that particular situation, it's just land that we're providing. But that so the, land the lease is for the land. More because it's in the, um, right in the CBD. So, ba yeah, so, so that, ba that ba simple proposal is that we land whatever in whatever term we we have an underlying lease. We technically it could revert back to us in years to come, obviously, uh, theoretically. Uh, but what we're saying is if yeah, there's two the two funding models. It's all right. I'll I'll go <laughs> offline and I'll yeah. clarify a couple of things. It's all right. I mean the girl, girl guides. That would be. Is that their site up at uh, up in um, the gardens there? The, yes. The small. Yeah, because that's a small. So just take that one. The girl guides association. At the moment, they're paying two ninety three. They're a small 
um, troop, a uh, group, uh, my daughter used to be involved with them years ago, that would bounce up to 1174, but it wouldn't. So it's based on the, the total income of the guides. It has nothing to do with the financial viability of that particular group. Yeah, and that's that's why we've got the three prong test to see to test out that financial viability, because they may be they may have a lot of revenue, but they may be in um, significant deficit. Yeah. Can I just clarify those groups that we've got there are the ones that have a revenue over two million. It doesn't necessarily mean they all meet that threshold for the um, A, B, and C it, factors. Yeah. Again, it would be dependent on the, um, the the surplus at the time. So we make the assessment on the day. Uh, yeah, and it'll and be upon lease application, we'll be looking at the last three years of financials. So our financials are just, we had a quick look at the most recent financials, one year, to see, to get a feel for what the impact might be. Now the, uh, the Rokora Haura or Tainui Trust, that, that's the location, the address of that is again? Because obviously that's a significant jump. Um, Enderley, Enderley Park Community Centre. Right, so that's from two to eight. Yeah, that's that's just reflective of a uh, a change in the rental subsidy. If you had a if, if you had a second uh, tier of fifty percent, um, then that would be what the new amount would be in terms of their yeah. rent. But what? as as you can see, within their surplus is um, way under the 100,000, it's only 700. So that's where um, they wouldn't meet all those three thresholds. So we're just but trying to show you that. What does that, that mean, Karen? That no, they so, wouldn't so attract the new rental, is that right? Yes, yeah, so, so that's just, that's based on the, yep. the recent financials. So at the time of the renewal of their lease, that is when we would make that assessment. This is just, to, this yep. is purely to be indicative of the groups that are earning a significant uh, amount of money, i.e. over $2 million for the purposes of that assessment. In terms of that specific activity on that specific side, I'm trying to work out the impact. Would, would it be ex expected or would it absorb that? What would be the impact? So the impact is that would be, a th if, if they were to meet that criteria, the impact at that time would be an increase of rent um, by 37, well, a reduction in their subsidy, a further reduction of 37.5%. So their their rental subsidy would be 50% as opposed to being 87.5%. I'm not honestly shooting the messenger because you're just giving us the models. What I'm trying to tease out is, is that, you know, the, the effect. So what you've got the large organisations, I get all that, but the actual what that means in terms of that specific um, activity and whether or not the large organisation is going to be prepared to, to continue to subsidise that particular activity. Yeah, so we're still subsidising them by 50% on the market rate. So they'd pay, in this case, they would pay an extra six and a half grand almost, approximately, yeah, but for yeah, that so site. I, I guess yeah, the no sure. nature of the question, if I hear you right, Councillor yeah. Gallagher, is if you've got an organisation that's supported nationally and therefore that triggers the threshold, Will they then be disadvantaged because they're nationally supported? Their local operations will feel a disadvantage. And herein lies the issues because we can only make that assessment on the financials that are provided at the time, which I suppose is the, the question right. that came up earlier. That's right. So you don't know until you're at that point of time and you assess their local Correct. situation. Correct. And, and hence why the, the existing 87.5% blanket subsidy uh, doesn't require this amount of um, assessment to determine whether they're in or out. Okay. And that is the challenge Any of this option, is, as you said, that the financials Correct. for these individual premises will be much lower and potentially not, if you not looked relevant. at by premises, what their financials were, all these groups potentially would um, be under the threshold. Okay. Uh, but I it's the national bodies that actually hold the lease, so that's what we've looked at. Right, that, I understand that. So, um, <coughs> Councillor Taylor, is this a question or you want to move an amendment? Oh, yes, please. We move B as an amendment, He's Madam Chair. seconded Jim. by Councillor Bunting. Uh, yeah. No question on that at this time? <laughs> no question? Oh, yeah. No, no question. Thanks, Councillor Madam Hamilton. Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just one more question. Sorry, Rick, I didn't pick yeah. it up earlier. No, that's fine. Um, on page 8, or item 9, attachment 3, the clean version of option A. Um, 70 of our ones, I think. Um, Point 37, 
uh, where an approved commercial activity is operated by a commercial entity is 65.5. So I didn't see that earlier. So have we got already a, a bit of a commercial factor in the policy? So, sorry, looking at the um, the track change yes. version? Yes. Commercial activities offered by the um, Yeah, so, so all, all that suggesting is, I suppose, um, all that suggesting is that for that particular area which is deemed to have a commercial activity, for example, it might have a, a, a pro shop of um, a 20 square metre right. uh, footprint, then they would be charged at that rate. Right. Where it's a commercial entity running the operation. Okay. Yeah. So a further quarter subsidy, reduction in subsidy. That's already built into that plan A then. Yeah. Which sort of mitigates that other reason for that tier two in, to some, in some ways. Yeah, so uh, the a commercial activity which is operated by the, the group itself is um, receives uh, the full uh, su rental subsidy, whether that be 87.5% uh, or if you went for option B, it would be either 87.5% or 50%. Um, where the commercial activity is operated by a commercial entity, um, so somebody that's uh, a business, a company that's running something like a pro shop in a, um, in a community occupancy, occupying that particular area, then that area receives the lowest subsidy. That area receives a further subsidy, uh, further reduction in their subsidy. Is that the 65.5? Correct. And that exists under option A? That exists under both options, option right. A and B. Okay. Thank yep. you. Oh, hello. Sorry. I was thinking no more questions, but then hello. Welcome back. Thank you. Apologies Councillor, for, for have lateness. you finished your questions, Councillor Hamilton? It's you following finished? the same one. Okay. Off you go, uh, Councillor. I don't person. quite understand the wording then. If it says it's a 65.5% subsidy, if the, if the full rent was a was 100 bucks, let's say now, they'd, they'd be charged $34.50 for that portion. That's correct, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so, but why is that higher than the 50% um, oh, partial community you, subsidy? Oh, you perhaps might have uh, missed some of the conversation. So they, yeah. there are the two policies. Yeah. Um, in the second policy, then there's a further reduction in relation to the second tier. So they both receive the equivalent um, percentage in terms of their uh, fraction in terms of their reduction. They're both reduced further by one quarter in both of the policies. It's just that um, in this particular one that we're looking at, this is only one of the policies which is up for adoption. So this is option option A or option B. So this wouldn't apply to the one with 50%? So, so both policies have the exact same function in them around commercial activities. The only difference in terms of the policies is the rental subsidy rate. So there would be two tier in option B and one tier in option A. Yeah, no, I, that doesn't make any sense to me, sorry, um, in response, and I do understand the underlying policy. Um, it, if you've got... Is this a got, question? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm trying to find, tease out what it actually means in okay. practice. Cool. Um, and using the example of a golf club is quite good because they do have, <laughs> all have that pro shop commercial activity. What say their... What, what would their rent be for the, tw for the 20 square metre pro shop if, the un if their basic subsidy was seen as 50% under that option B? <coughs> So in the in situation of the golf club, if we make the assumption that um, it's $100 for, if we use that example, if, if you'd like to use that example, um, under option B, they would, if the market rate is $100, yep. they would pay $50 for any area which is not deemed an area which is occupied by a commercial activity. Yeah. And for that, which is? And for an area for that 20 square metres um, that is occupied by a commercial activity, they would be paying. I just want to. I want to get this absolutely right. 70. Yeah. So they they would be for that area. They would be paying 20. 20. Oh, sorry. 
they would be paying. There's a there's a lot of moving parts here, so I'm just trying to work through it. So, so there's if, if I can if I can bring it up a level and try and explain it at the high level, um, with with we'll just explain it with the um, option A. So if there was a 87.5% um, rental subsidy, yep. if they had a commercial operation run by the group, they still get the 87.5% rental subsidy. On everything but. No, that's that's for for everything because the the group might have um, uh, Dawn, who's running a, a little thing for the group, so all the all the money's going back into the group. So the the group actually has that uh, commercial activity. If the commercial activity is run by somebody that's putting the money into their own pocket, then that activity would be the the rental subsidy would be sixty five point five percent. So, so the distinguishing point I'm is even that more confused now. So the distinguishing point, as I undertake it, as I understand it, is if the commercial activity is an independent commercial activity for profitability of an external agent, then the quarter reduction applies. If the profitability of the commercial aspect is to sustain the core functions of the club group organisation, the quarter reduction does not apply. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I well didn't understand that for yep. myself now until it was articulated. So yeah, absolutely. You've done Thank a brilliant you. job. But that's not the question I was asking. I was asking, trying to find out whether uh, how the 65.5% applies to a, an organisation whose underlying sub, <coughs> you know, is it a further subsidy or further, so How does the 65.5% subsidy that Ryan identified on page 70 uh, perhaps for if commercial I could, portions, how if does I could, that apply to if, the if two I could different rental levels? Yeah, if, if I could turn you to page 60, one of our colleagues has just pointed out that it might be easier if you just have a look at page 60 to try and explain this, this model. Um, you'll see the, the staggered approach, and it's in essence what um, Madam Chair has just described. Um, it might be a little bit easier to navigate through that, and perhaps if you still have a question, then happy to. That's paragraph 39. That's correct, paragraph 39, that table. So if, yeah, okay. Yep. No, I can, now, this is with that, the two-tiered two subsidy yeah. yep. option yep. in the policy. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's one additional layer yeah. So of yeah, subsidy. You work out the underlying layer, then you apply the additional the layer. Court, the, the, one. Yeah, mm. the one fourth additional reduction yep. in subsidy. So the, yeah, mm. no, I understand how the two work together. Looking at that table, thanks. Okay, thank down you. Down the bottom, thirty nine. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, any further questions, Councillor McPherson? No, thanks. Okay, Councillor Henry. <coughs> Um, thank you so much, and thank you for your report. Look, just following on, I just saw something here on page 60. So the council may use its discretion to approve a further rental subsidy where exceptional circumstances apply. So there's still an openness there Carry, to, yeah. to, to some groups. I'm just looking at the different groups, and I'm just seeing some of the gr groups we really have to be more lenient than other groups where you, you know there's a huge commercial entity besides it as well. Absolutely. I mean, everything gets approved by you guys okay. in, in, in that sense, yeah. Uh, it was 40, 40 in page 60. Okay, I think we've um, got through the debate now, so uh, through the questions, sorry. Um, oh, you have another question, Councillor no. Taylor? No, good. So now we'll move to the recommendations, and Councillor Hamilton is the mover of the substantive motion. Councillor Taylor is the mover of an amendment. So you may like to speak to it first, please, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, the amendment is the alternative. The, uh, yeah, so option A is status quo, option B, which is moved by Councillor Hamilton, seconded by myself, and option B is the um, changes. Option B is moved by Councillor Taylor and seconded by Councillor Bunting. Fallen, with your leave, may I just ask a question? Do both of them include paragraph 49? Because <clears throat> I'm concerned about the addition of staff ability to amend guidelines in the policy. All applications to operate a commercial activity shall be assessed in accordance with the guidelines? Yes. Yes, both include that. So they're both, both of them include that? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. 
So, Councillor Hamilton, you're um, first in the debate. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I think this has been a, a good uh, request by elected members to, to just look and review. Um, but having weighed and measured uh, the response, there doesn't appear to be a big trigger in terms of uh, outlawing commercial activity or, or outlying commercial activity in terms of um, that. The, uh, the, uh, also having a clear understanding of for staff to actually delve in and assess a financial situation of a, of a charitable organisation or non-profit or commercial activity versus the, the financial savings is fairly moot. Um, there's not a lot of gain there. There could be an argument for um, uh, equity, but I don't think we're really hitting trigger points at this point in time. Um, also, in terms of using surplus as one of the metrics, um, if an organisation was aware of that, then it was fairly, fairly easy to hide your 100k surplus pretty easily um, to avoid uh, that uh, form of measurement. Um, and also, I take comfort in the point that Councillor Siggy raised, point 40, we've still got a, an ability to use discretion and, and uh, use a further re rental subsidy in exceptional circumstances. So I have comfort uh, with the status quo on this, this occasion and having talked to, to staff. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I fully appreciate that there's not a lot of dollars at stake here, and I fully appreciate that there's not a lot of organisations involved. but. Um, I still believe we need to be sure we are not giving ratepayers money away um, to people who don't need it. Um, and to me, the argument that there's not a lot of money involved um, doesn't stack up. There is some money involved. And uh, we need to remember when we're talking about these subsidies that we're talking about ratepayers' money. It's not money that's just nebulously floating around. It's money that we're taking off the ratepayers to subsidise organisations that in some cases don't need it. Not a lot of cases, but in some cases. Uh, I totally support ratepayers subsidising community organisations' rent if they genuinely need that support. We should be doing that. What I'm saying is some organisations don't. Some have government contracts. Some have uh, more than $2 million in revenue, and I wish the businesses I was involved in were bringing in that sort of revenue. Um, some have more than 100k in the bank, and again, I wish I had that uh, more than 100k in the bank myself. Um, but I need, do I need to remind everyone that we've just hit the ratepayers up with a 9.7% rate rise? If we're going to be doing that, then we need to be ensuring that we're running a tight ship. To me, this is not an example of that. It's all a bit laissez-faire. If you're giving money away to someone who doesn't need it, then that's a cavalier use of ratepayers' money. I don't care what the scale is, small or large. You shouldn't be doing it. To me, it's unfair uh, for ratepayers to be subsidising organisations, even if they're performing a community or, uh, uh, service. I get that. But some of them are almost operating uh, like commercial entities. They're, you know, they're, they're large scale. And they don't need the money, some of them. Uh, and some of them are already being funded by the taxpayer as well. So I uh, urge other councillors to support option B because I think we shouldn't be letting these things through the cracks. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, monitor these things and we ensure that no ratepayers' money gets wasted. No matter how small an amount, it's still significant to me. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that just pretty much said it all. Look, the thing that we've got to keep at this level in their heads is that a subsidy is the price that, that we pay on behalf of the rate fire payer for community good. So we are definitely getting value out of these subsidies. So I appreciate the decisions that are being made. But I, I do agree with Jeff in that, you know, no stone unturned. Um, we are entering uh, a new era of financial prudence. Um, I don't buy the, from what I can gather, amongst a lot of complicated stuff in there, it was just quite simply too hard. Um, to ask for the financial position locally of these organisations. And I, I, I maintain, having seen this for 13 years you know, in a major charitable organisation, it's not hard to ask for the local books. Um, so uh, can they afford this rent? Now, I certainly, I'm certainly not one to penalise groups who are doing well either, who are doing 
very, very well. These organisations, if you look at the list that we've got here, and thank you for circulating this, this is a really useful document. Um, these ones here are very, they're huge organisations. They can't afford their rent. They can't afford their rent without the 87% uh, subsidy that um, our ratepayers are being asked to do. I'd also note that some of these two, uh, we are also giving them community grants as well. So we're subsidising them uh, quite, a f uh, quite a few times. So look, um, I'm not going to die in a ditch over it, but um, I, I, on this occasion, I do agree with Jeff in that um, we've just, you know, we've we've got to do everything we possibly can to ensure best value for the ratepayer. And we've just seen in the last debate that the pressure that there is on these community spaces as well. There's not a lot of them. So um, look, if uh, if organisations get so successful that they can then operate independently, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? And that's got to be a good thing. We're we're giving a um, a hand up rather than a hand out. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Uh, I can't support either um, uh, option because I am really concerned with paragraph 49, which, um, and it talks about uh, the second bullet down, addition of staff ability to amend guidelines to the policy. You look for, at all the other bullet points and everything refers to guidelines. And I, I think what we're doing, and, I, and, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, because if I'm wrong, I will withdraw and vote for one of them. Um, I think what we're doing is delegating something, I think, to, to staff, which is, um, how do I say this? I think should be a responsibility of the council, of the governing group here. Um, and we've, we've just had the discussion about who's gonna get um, the bowling club. Uh, it's, it's, these, it's these sort of organisations we're talking about. And um, no disrespect to what Jeff's saying, I totally agree with you. There wouldn't be anyone on this table who's more precious about rate power money, but there's a heck of a lot of stuff that these guy, these um, uh, non-for-profit organisations do that if they weren't doing it, the money, the, the people would come to us for the money. So you get a heck of a, so you, we've got to protect the sector to a certain extent because there's an awful lot, and any of you, most of us, all of us I assume around this table have been involved in these sorts of organisations, and there's millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of voluntary time, voluntary effort, voluntary resources put into these things, which if the volunteers weren't doing it, um, the community would come to us and or central government. So I'm a bit protective about this stuff. So I'm just concerned that I think we are giving staff too much latitude with the guidelines and the policy. And um, uh, uh, forgive me, I haven't read the whole policy, uh, the guideline thing, but um, there is a lot in there that, that to me is very substantial. It's a, a lot of material stuff is in the guidelines um, uh, and we uh, we address the po at, at a policy level. And I, and I don't, uh, this is a change I assume from previously. Yeah, OK, all right. So um, I don't think either of them, <coughs> either of the proposals up here don't address that concern, which is my point. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Thanks. When the whole policy was brought in, the one that we're looking to potentially amend now, I didn't support that. Uh, and interesting to note, and there was at least one other councillor here who didn't support that either at the same time, we received about, uh, from memory, there were about 100 groups gave submissions, and the overwhelming majority, about 80% of them, opposed the new policy, but it still went through. So we didn't exactly follow the feedback we got at that time, but it was being pushed through politically. And uh, I predicted, as did other, some other councillors, that it would cause, the new policy would cause more administration and more uncertainty than it solved. And I think that's it's proving to be the case at the moment. Um, some of us were concerned about the inequality of apply, applying a blanket rule or figure to all, count, all um, uh, community groups, because all community groups are not alike. Some are small local ones, some are branches of big national ones. Maybe some do of them don't have a lot of money, some of them do, some local ones have a lot of money. But we, we weren't comparing apples with apples when we brought in the new policy. Um, so we've tried to devise a means of some, some differentiation. And while I don't know whether the figure of 50% is right or the figure of 65.5 for extra commercial 
charges is right, whether the, the figure, the only rationale actually for the figure of 87.5% was that if you applied that to all groups currently sitting on land like that, it would bring in approximately the same income. Now, is that the right way of doing it? I didn't think so at the time, but it was, uh, it was, it was at least it was logical. You could understand the logic. Uh, the whole thing is fairly illogical because there's so many different groups with so many different circumstances. I don't think we can I, 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 normally I would have supported what um, Ryan has said but I don't think we can do this one size fits all and the amendment, uh, Jeff's, Councillor Jeff's motion is slightly closer to looking at horses it's for courses sort of policy so I'm going to support that in this circumstance I do point out to Councillor Ryan that point 40 on page 60 where he said he had some comfort because there was a, a final uh, come back to council over these figures. That only applies, and if you read it, it says that, to actually lowering the figure further. So I'm saying if someone gets charged, only, given only the 50% subsidy, they can appeal, if you like, if that's the right word, to council for that to be raised. But you can't go the other way around. And it hasn't had, the two or three cases we've had have all been to try and increase the subsidy that was applied, not to reduce the subsidy. So I'd rather have it set slightly tougher for some bigger groups now and give them the opportunity to put a case to have it reduced. I think that's a slightly better way to handle it, but the whole thing, this isn't the end of the story. You're going to hear more about it, I'm quite sure, and you're going to have more appeals and more issues with it over time. I just don't think it quite works for us, but that's another story. Thank you. Councillor Gallagher? Oh, I'm still... Um, yeah. Certainly, was with Councillor McPherson that on that issue. But the, I'm, I'm completely. See, the girl guides, for example. Now, obviously, we hope they're paying two nine through. That's just a small group um, in the vicinity of the Hamilton Gardens. Uh, that will be an impact because while they you have national organisations, a lot of the fundraising is at actually at a at a localised level. So, a national organisation is head office and 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 all of that. Uh, then I think you actually have to, to, to say, well, take life unlimited charitable trust. Now, they obviously have an advantage in sitting on leasehold land, but uh, they provide a huge service for residents. All residents, as we know, are ratepayers. So um, they provide a huge not-for-profit service with, with, for residents who, who are obviously have challenges in terms of uh, disabilities, etc. Um, if we look to the Waikato Kindergarten Association, again, uh, not-for-profit, um, St John's Ambulance, currently that's the, the, the dominant provider of services, does a heck of a lot of uh, not-for-profit work uh, with young people. So I'm probably, on this case, probably going to go um, with, with the motion. I do acknowledge the reasoning behind the amendment. If the amendment does become the motion, I do hope that um, we have a very good, flexible and intuitive appeal process. That, that's all I'd say, because I think that in the cases would be um, important, because obviously, as Councillor McPherson said, and we all know, one size will not fit all, and uh, I think we do have to be very careful that we don't confuse some small groups that are attached to an organisation, but rely very much on their own local fundraising. Yeah. Look, I, I agree with um, with um, Councillor McPherson and um, Gallagher, uh, although I will go with what Councillor McPherson um, uh, with the amendment because, again, and I think I was one of the other ones that challenged it. <laughs> when we talked about it at a briefing, um, because I looked at uh, Te Koha Health and, um, and they do get a lot of funding and um, they are a very commercial entity. And so, uh, but again, then you look at the Girl Guides and so this um, on page 60, 40 gives me actually the, the um, a bit of a better feeling that the like girl guides can come to us and ask us for reduction of their lease and also the scout association if they because they do a lot of hands-on work they do a lot of fundraising just like um council gallagher said um it, you know so we have to weigh up how they get their money i i know um uh, Plunkett gets a whole lot of money 
and uh, uh, yeah, I won't say any more about that. Um, so you know, there's so we have to weigh weigh up what they actually do and and um, and and where they get the money from. So finding out more about that, that's, that would be really helpful so we can make some good decisions for these groups because some of them work extremely hard and, and it's tough for them out there. And um, I always find, um, uh, we were just at, a, um, at the Momentum, um, the Women's Fund, um, um, launch and uh, out of the the, um, the charitable money that goes around in the world, only 10% goes to women and, and girls. So um, I think we need to give them some help there. Um, they work really hard. So yeah, so I will go with the amendment. Thank you. Thank, thank you, councillors. Um, my own comment on this is that I'm going, well, obviously I've seconded the um, uh, substantive motion. The reason being is that this just seems administratively cumbersome for very little gain. Um, and um, I don't think we've quite got the thresholds quite where, where they need to be. It feels a little bit like robbing Peter to pay Paul, except Paul gets paid peanuts. So um, I noticed the other day, I totally support the um, aspect of uh, reducing the subsidy on commercial activities um, but I think that was one area we could have explored a bit more because, in truth, all commercial activities have some private benefit unless, of course, the services are all pr provided at cost or used internal or staff or volunteers of the organisation. And we know that's not the case when you've got things like um, chemists or um, where things are sold. There's always a markup. There's always a private benefactor from that in a commercial sense or people wouldn't do it. Uh, but I also acknowledge that it is through the commercial activities where many of these um, organisations and charities are able to derive some of their personal profit to spend in programmes. So I don't want to disable that, but I've always felt that we should um, make a, a point of difference between those charities that don't have commercial aspects supporting them and those that do. That's where I was quite keen to support this work that has occurred. Um, having said that, uh, look, I know that some of these organisations that look quite big on paper, like the Order of St John's, in fact, ironically, when I was reading my agenda the other day, preparing for this again, I, know, I saw on the TV news, TV3 news, uh, the Order of St John. Uh, in Wellington talking to government about the need for greater funding for preventative primary health services, not just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, as they put it. Pun intended, I think, on their part. And, and I was just um, reminded that no matter of the scale of the organisation, what they get in is what they do. Um, so it's horses for courses. Some, some charities will remain smaller and some will become very large and their work will expand into the space as well. Um, and sometimes they do grow large because the need for them is there. So I'm just not sure we hit the mark with the changes. And for that reason, and as I say, because it has very little financial, if no financial gain to council by the time we go through administ extra administration, plus potentially extra appeals to the process, um, we come out no better off in my view. So that is why I'm supporting Councillor Hamilton in his motion. No other speakers? We will go to the vote. Oh, you do. You do. Sorry. Apologies. Right of reply. Me first? Mm, it's only you. You're the only oh. one. Oh, okay. Very I good. You, <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to thank Councillor McPherson for pointing out the clarity of um, point 40 and bringing that to my attention. I, I stand corrected. I agree this is not a perfect science, and uh, I think we all philosophically agree that we want the best for the ratepayer. And to Councillor Jeff's point, um, we don't want to waste ratepayers' money, but this process is a little bit of a, a distribution process. We'll take it back and then burn it up and uh, ratepayer money to find, search, research, proof, correspond, bring it back to elected members, argue, etc. So I'm all for efficiency, but this is, uh, as, a, as our good chair was pointing out, administratively cumbersome. We're after um, a lean result, and um, 
as our own staff have said, they both lack the resource and the financial literacy, literacy to be able to do this um, justice. So I don't think it's quite hit the mark. Um, I do acknowledge there's a lot of work gone into this and it's definitely a step in the right direction regardless of which option goes forward today. Um, I do just want to remind Councillor Jeff that with a national rule, sometimes the little local people will be punished. So a sad face emoji. <laughs> Um, and uh, I also think we do need to spend a little bit more energy working out how we will uh, def determine and define financial performance because obviously it's going to be very easy for commercial operators to blur that line to make that surplus disappear with some good accounting practice. So uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the vote and we put the amendment first. So we're voting on the amendment, which is the tier. The Option B. What? The, the amendment as well. The amendment is carried. So that now becomes the substantive motion. The amendment as a substantive motion is carried 6 4 3 against. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, staff, and happy flying, Ricky. All right, councillors, bear with me because we have got two visitors here, so we're going to take the next two items the first being the Gallagher Academy of Performing Arts, the second being the Clarence Street Theatre, and then we will discuss having a short break so that maybe we'll be able to have a short working day. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so what are this right now? Yep, okay. Sure. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Jeremy. Kia ora, Kia ora. Uh, ora team. I just really uh, want to um, I give uh, you guys an opportunity to have a conversation with Jeremy if you wish. The report's in here. Jeremy's the manager of the academy. I uh, just want to bring it to your attention that the 1998 contract uh, expires this year, which means this is the penultimate report, uh, being that we fund the university calendar year, not council's financial years. So we'll have a 2018 report uh, next year. So happy to answer any questions. Jeremy, do you want to? Um, Kia ora the report is in a similar format to previous years, mm -hmm. and as you're probably mostly aware, um, the, the terms of the contract are the that the academy should uh, demonstrate that um, at least 25% of the use of the academy in any one year is for genuine uh, community uh, use, and also that our, our funding is also linked to that in the sense that uh, council provides 25% uh, subsidy. Um, uh, after income has been reduced, uh, deducted from our uh, from our overall budget, um, and I'm very pleased to say that last year again we um, comfortably exceeded the 25% minimum, um, and for community or educational use, um, and reached 32%. Um, and that also uh, the grant that um, City Council had to pay us last year um, was less. Um, so City Council got two wins, uh, in, uh, a nice healthy um, use over um, the expected contracted 25% uh, use, um, plus a reduction in the amount of money that we're being paid to the university for operating the, the academy. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, sorry, I'm just let me get there. Councillor Gallagher. Um, obviously, I'll, I'll save some brief commentary in the when we move receive the report. But um, acknowledging that, obviously, as we don't have a contract with you moving forward, um, then obviously all we can do is, is in a lobby situation. But I guess in the light of the total community corporate contribution to this excellent centre. Can you give us a feel of what the university's attitude or approach will be around that community use in the future? And that's purely just for our information, really. 
uh, it's an ongoing discussion uh, within the university. There's no sign at the moment that the university is backing away from its community relationship at all. And I would hope that there will it be more or less business as usual. Certainly, if you look to the list of the groups who use us year in, year out, uh, it's very st steady, standard. They come back to us. They love the centre that's right for them and what they're trying to do. And the rates that we've been uh, that we've been charging them have worked well for their operations. Um, the university uh, has not put any pressure on us at the moment to increase our commercial um, aspect. Um, it, it's it's hard because we're a joint centre. We're both a teaching centre yeah, during the day, yes. and then we're really only available from about five o'clock onwards sure. in the evenings or the weekends. So there's not much space for us there to kind of max or increase or maximise our commercial um, high reach. Yeah. Um, uh, just tell me, if, and I'm sorry, I don't recall, but I might be wrong. Did did you make a did the university make a submit you know through our LTP you know obviously this proposal <coughs> as part of redirecting our funding to other you know arts projects we'd made that proposal did, did they make a submission? Um, Alistair Jones came with me last year when I yeah. when I was presenting the same report to council yeah. and we did talk a little bit at that time about what the future but might be. In terms of the LTP yeah. proposal, I'm just yeah. wanting to just yeah. just to clarify. I am not privy to that to be yeah. honest. No, I, I can't comment. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I don't believe the university put in a particular no, no, I'm not, I'm not, um, address I'm just in the tenure just for plan. Information. I'm not yeah. making a, a, a comment no. um, either way. We can we can confirm that with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. No, thank you. That's helpful. I'll, I'll save my for, for debate. Okay, thank you. Just a quick. Oh, I'll come to myself in a minute, Councillor Henry. Oh, it's actually just a question on what I just read here. Um, and, um, you, I don't know whether you can answer me that, but on the 22nd of August, it was under miscellaneous, was um, Dog Predator Free 2050 Trap Library launch. Was that um, when Maggie Berry came to speak? MP Maggie Berry, do you know that one? Or? Can you take this one offline? I, oh, I can. Yeah, I'm not yeah. Quite yeah sure no, that's relevant. fine. That's fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm just a bit stunned. <coughs> Okay, Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, just a, uh, uh, picking up on a point that um, the, the Deputy Mayor raised there on about community um, usage and rates, etc., etc. I'm just trying to uh, weigh up how much was university usage, like the Vice Chancellor's dinner and the Vice Chancellor's breakfast, uh, and things like that. But um, is is it written into a, an agreement, uh, you know, in perpetuity, that there will be a certain ratio of community versus varsity use? In there, or is that uh, contingent on funding? No, no. The, the requirement in the contract was 25% for com right. what's called called communities dash educational, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that you know it's been consistently reported over the 20 years in this format right. to show the kind of groups that qualify under that community educational kind of um, name. Okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Just uh, regards the. Vice Chancellor of Dinner and Breakfast. What does OVC stand for then? Office of the Vice Chancellor. Sorry. Oh, Lots thank of you. Acronyms. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, he's using it quite a lot. Great. Okay. No, thank you. Appreciate. It. No worries. Thank you. Just a couple of questions for me, just to um, get some clarity around. I, list, I looked at the attachment um, um, to, to the attachment of all the uh, list of actual events to um, kind of understand how community events are defined. I do notice just one or two smaller anomalies. I wondered if you might comment on one of them was um, the law faculty event lecture and the inaugural profes professorial lectures, which I could could interpret as being university work. And there's one or two of the music things that also sit within the teaching arena of the university. Is there a definition of community use or? Um, strictly speaking, the the contract doesn't really define it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. The, I think there's a, a call sometimes to be made on some of those. My my working definition is if the if it's open to the community and it's being advertised to the community and the community will come and enjoy that particular event, then I think it's... And there's quite clearly a, a local community connection here, then I think that's a, a genuine community use. Um, I think if you look at the commercial list, which is much, much smaller, mm. then that's quite clearly a private um, mm. 
uh, weddings, funerals, huh? uh, you know, uh, that's quite clearly a, a familial or a commercial use. I mean, the list on the commercial list is, is um, a PricewaterhouseCooper, I think, are on there. Um, Spark, maybe, Lugtons, um, mm. Deloitte's, um, Weathers, and somebody, Calvin Cruikshank, who's quite clearly a commercial entertainer, uh, definitely not local, uh, and he's paying top dollar to use the space in order to make the money that he does. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And just one yeah. other question then. In terms of the, uh, the percentage, um, yeah. is it the percentage by number of events or percentage by time across the use facility? It's by number of events or the use. It's called a use. Mm. And that, again, that's in the contract. And a use... I think I remember talking to this last year. Uh, a use can be just an afternoon tea in one room, or it could be a school ball, which is using the whole venue from 9 o'clock in the morning till midnight. Mm. So mm. It, it's, it's a slightly clumsy um, measure, uh, but uh, that's what we've got. That's what the way we've done it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So um, the... I don't think I have anyone else. So the, um, the motion, the, it's just that it be, be, be received. So somebody to move, Councillor Gallagher, Councillor Tooman. Thank you. Any debate? Yes, there is. There is. Um, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I, I, um, a, as you know, historically, you know, I've been a critic of, of the um, branding, and I think it's just been just as so much directed at our council because overall we've spent, I think, $4.18 million in total uh, and I was very surprised, even one or two staff I talked to here had no idea even that we actually had that investment. We were uh, giving that ratepayer subsidy as our contribution to performing arts and community use. Uh, so that told me we as a council must do much better to tell our residents and ratepayers uh, what we are doing. And certainly I, th I would anticipate there's a big project involving the university with the regional facility down the track where we would be certainly on the ground working that through. That's not a criticism uh, of the people, of you who run the centre, because you actually take your instruction. And I realise there's a balance with the you know, your other excellent sponsorships from the community. It doesn't at all ever detract uh, from the fantastic centre it is. And I guess through our LTP, uh, it wasn't, you know, thumb our nose. It was just, look, we have to make a choice at this point to direct funding somewhere else in terms of the a project we have, as you know. Having said that, uh, I think a really clear commitment through our LTP to sit with the university and others around another major um, facility. Uh, I, I would hope to the Vice Chancellor and the University Council that they will not forget moving forward that there's been sufficient community contribution and that there will be a community dynamic. Having said that, uh, this centre is a very critical part of the academic tapestry of the university, the, the performing arts uh, conferences. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible, uh, incredible facility. And also, <coughs> it reminds us that around it, dare I say it, I don't want to rave too long, we have wonderful green space, we have wonderful walking public opportunities. Thanks for not being like half the schools in this town and fencing off your green space. It's open there because you recognise totality. This is a community university. This is our community space of which um, the centre is, is an integral uh, part. So I say that while we are, if you like, terminating, ending this particular relationship, we're absolutely not, not, not ending the relationship with the university as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, I'm not, uh, supporting receiving the report, obviously. Um, I had some history with the Well Trust when we sponsored this thing uh, many moons ago, and I was, I was very uh, cognizant of when we uh, relinquished the naming rights to Gallagher uh, that it would be it remain a community facility. Um, it's really interesting reading, and um, you know, thank heavens for the office of the Vice Chancellor because uh, amongst his breakfasts and his staff drinks and his dinners and everything. He's a very good patron of that. I'm looking forward to him using the gym as much as he uses the um, this 19 out of 93 uh, bookings on behalf of the university. So good on you. Um, but, you know, this is actually quite significant to us because this probably will be a, a discussion we have, I'd imagine, Martin, when you're not such a new councillor in 10 years' time after the joint venture with the sports facility goes in. 
Um, what happens at the end of that when that's built? Does that become a university um, facility? We're going to have to have this, uh, this, this discussion down the track. So, um, look, it's a great facility. It's a beautiful facility. I've hosted and been a part of many, many do's there and look forward to many, many more. All success to you. Um, I think the council's job is done uh, with this one and we look forward to getting into the next one. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say um, um, it's an amazing um, diversity of events that do actually occur there. When I read through the list, I realised actually I've been to quite a few things across the various different categories, and I'm sure I will continue to do so, including, by the way, Councillor Bunting, one or two of the officer, Office of the Vice-Chancellor um, lectures slash breakfast slash business lunches. And uh, very useful networking events those are as well. But um, yes, no, I am pleased about that. I wonder if the, in going future, going forward, that um, there might be some tightening around the definition of uh, community use. But um, it's not our business anymore, of course. Um, but obviously, you're going to run it in a, a business-like model. So I would imagine that a number of, as you've said, the repeat customers are going to remain in that space because it's very much fit for purpose. So, and um, if we can get a fit for purpose recreation centre on the campus too, we'll, it'll be um, a happy day as well. So, but thank you very much for the work you do at the Performing Arts Academy. And we're going to take a vote on the report. The motion is carried unanimously. That's the first for the day. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillors, we'll take Jason next and then we'll um, deliberate on whether we have what sort of a, a break we need to get through the rest of the day. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Kia ora councillors, uh, again a uh, similar process here, I've allowed Jason to speak and we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, as the last item was the penultimate report, this is the final report in terms of the deed of gift. So that um, extension that happened uh, a few months ago around increasing the revocation period, um, it has all been complete with the works that have um, the trust have done and they've completed the uh, KPIs that have been set out in that contract and so this is the uh, uh, final report in this form. So. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, oh there we go, look at that, oh there, look at that. Uh, yeah, I, thank you very much. Um, we have um, completed all our, as um, Andy has mentioned, all our K KPIs to the, to the city um, and we've completed our strengthening works, we've com also completed um, when we came back um, sort of middle of last year to to get the, well, it, late last year in fact, I think it was, um, to get the, the money for the roof. Um, that's, all, that's all been completed, um, so we don't leak as much anymore. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're, we're in a great uh, state, we're very sustainable, we're moving forward. Our next big projects will be um, actually getting equipment to run the building. Um, as part of the gift, we were gifted some equipment, which um, unfortunately was never fit for purpose, but um, we've moved on and, and our next plan is to, to actually equip the building um, so the community groups aren't charged um, um, for, for that infrastructure. We've spent probably about close to $300,000 in hiring equipment in the last three years, um, and that those, those costs are passed on to the community um, directly. So, so if we can reduce that, um, then again we can make ourselves more more accessible to more community groups and um, become even more sustainable. So that's our plan moving forward. Thank you. In fact, that was going to be my question: was about your sustainability going forward. How how you see that in 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 terms of what you've got coming up and in terms of where you've landed yourself now? Sure. The um, we've consistently grown audiences and occupancy over the three years, and for next year we um, are already sitting at over sixty percent occupancy, which for this time of the year is um, in, uh, incredibly high. So I would I would assume we'd probably get almost to seventy percent for next year, which is 
which is, if you think about it, is approaching um, a venue like um, Bay Court in Tauranga. Um, they get to about 80% occupancy, um, and they're their own, only venue essentially in the city. So we're doing, I think we're doing a fantastic job in that respect. Um, we've got a wide range of events. There's a huge amount of communities, schools, um, and uh, charitable groups, and we do fundraising concerts as well. So we've got a wide range of activity, um, both performances, but also our rehearsals, our, our various spaces that we use, not just for performing arts, but other events as well. Thank you very much. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I just want to ask you about things coming up. I'm just looking at this excellent app here called the Hamilton app, and <laughs> I noticed that um, there's nothing coming up in the near future. There is. There's, pl there's plenty coming up. Oh, cool. um, and from pretty much... <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> no, it, w it was a little bit of a shameless plug, wasn't it? But, however, the question is around the, the, the question is around what events coming up. Yeah, that's, what that's right. So, and from in September is probably a little bit quiet for us, but from October to the end of the year, it's essentially full. Yeah. Um, with all the dance schools, we've got okay. seven of them, I think they are. So. Um, Okay, so um, but the kind, the nature of shows, I'm just really interested in the way it's all panning out, and it all seems to be pretty successful now. Absolutely, we we um, we generally we're a, we're a, I guess a, a venue for hire, um, but what we also try and do is plug holes um, where we need to, whether it be um, bringing in things to, to to fill the program, or whether it be bringing in things to balance the program in terms of if it's dance or music or whatever it needs to be, sort of to give it a huge range of events across mm. all, mm. the, all the performing arts is, is the plan. Okay. And Thanks. that's what we do. So you've Thank got you. the full box, though. You've Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we'll look forward, forward to further conversations closer to the time that the um, um, Waikato Regional Theatre is, the Waikato Theatre gets up and going and what, what impact and the type of work that you do to sustain yourself. I think it'll the the work at a regional theatre obviously will um, have some um, impact on us. So there'll be the attrition going to the big new shiny event, big new shiny building. But I think it'll also give us opportunities um, that we don't currently have uh, to to program more um, events or and create events ourselves as well, um, which currently we don't need to or we're actually too full to be able to do so it's it, I don't see it as being a problem and and it'll be we look forward to working with the theatre excellent thank you very much and thank you also for the um, excellent work that you and your team do at Clarence Street thank you so we'll go to the vote oh we haven't done it yet have someone moved the report be received Councillor Bunting Councillor Gallagher and now we'll go to the vote do you have to allow commentary Madam Chair Oh, yeah. True. Sorry. Yes, I, I will. I won't be long. I, I can understand there's a, a sense of Sorry. a mood. Uh, and I know far more about the Clarence Street Theatre than some Hamilton app, which is not even on my machine. You, they've got to market that a bit better, but never mind. We'll get on with it. Um, but, uh, look, congratulate. I just want to make an observation, obviously, of our journey with you as well, and obviously join with Council, my good friend Councillor Bunting and the rest of us in congratulating you. Um, Something that really hits out is, is, is the composition of your trust. So it really hits out around your business model, around you know how you're running that, and, and I think that that's marvellous. And so if we look at that sort of journey from when it was just was a council theatre to what it is now, uh, similar to the Meteor journey, Rivoli in another sense. So just um, congratulations. That's all. Thank you. We were. I think we we're um, very lucky on the trustees that we have. We have a, you know a really strong governance trust, um, which, you know, with their um, connections within the city and also their business acumen, I think, is um, testament to why we're successful. Um, so I think that's really, really important. Thank you very much. Councillor Bunting. Very briefly, I'm very excited for you, and um, and I'm, I'm sure the end of this journey will end up in a different place to where we even started. Um, and the way the Meteor has, has done is, is a true testament to previous councils who have done really good decision making I think in this space and Andy thank you for supporting these people um, through their tough times especially with the strengthening work that must have been pretty stressful on all of you um, I look forward to attending many many more things there and uh, I know my kids have all performed there um, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing a lot more performances there so well done thank you, thank you very much and voting
The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Councillors, um, I can see that we have um, a couple of um, straightforward items and maybe one that will require a bit more conversation or two. So what I, I'm wondering whether you would like a short break now, um, say a quarter of an hour or so, grab something, a, a drink, and get a stretch, and then we just um, go through those last few items with the view that you should potentially get away a lot earlier in that way, or would you prefer to have a full lunch break and... Um, Well, I do need to just get up and stretch and get a drink. But so let's let's come back in qu quarter past and carry on and push through nice and early. Quarter past. Yes, I know. That's what we. You decided. You said you would like to plough on. Well, I was originally, but then you said you'd like to plough on. Um, I do need to get up and just do something. So a five minutes break. Grab a drink. No, exactly.
Okay, Council, we do have a quorum in the room, so we're going to plough on because I'm mindful of the fact that the staff also need their fair break. If it looks like the conversation is going to be protracted, then we will consider taking a proper break. But otherwise, we hope to get through in around an hour. I don't think these items should take more than that in all real terms. Fine. But don't forget our governance team, and they have uh, awards and contracts, so we just we just need to be very mindful of that, actually, and so I apologise, we should have... I oh, know, I've just said that, I just no, said that's that myself. Fine. No, that's all I don't good. Want it's very to... important, otherwise we will be in breach. I don't want to, to put the staff in any discomfort or what have you, so they'd say they're OK, so we'll plough on, and then they can be free, we can all be free, but if it becomes uncomfortably long, we will adjourn. Yeah, I told you, bring food, bring food in. OK, let's let's go. We are going to plough through some um, of the business end of things, which I didn't get to do before the item this morning, which is the confirmation of the community and services minutes from the last meeting on page seven. I will so move. Is there a seconder, Councillor Henry? Are there any questions around that? Not being any. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. The Chair's report, which is on page 15, I don't intend to speak to. I did circulate the notes from the Policy Advisory Group, as I do. Um, there's nothing else in there that um, needs commentary. So happy to move my report be accepted, although I probably shouldn't. Councillor Hamilton will move that my report gets accepted. Someone to second, please. Councillor Bunting, is there any questions that you have on me, of me on my report? I, one thing that Ziggy did ask me if she may have two minutes to uh, tell you of the key themes of the climate conference, and I agreed to do that, so we'll just do that now. Okay. Um, I've just written some things down, and I, I could have sent it out on email, but I, I've had some um, sweet ma email back in the past about my comments, so I, I just wasn't keen on getting some other sweet email. Otherwise, I have to give him a hug again, but he's not here today. So, um, so on August the 1st and 2nd, I attended the Environmental Defence Society conference in, in Auckland, and um, the EDS is a strong lobby and advisory group to the government on environmental issues. There were actually five ministers of parliament speaking on environmental reforms covering urban, fisheries, freshwater, resource management, law and conservation. And a very common theme was the importance of Maori input, which we, we are now working, working on here, and which is cool, and the necessity to think broader and start doing, not just talking. Now, they're really good. EDS is the same. They talk a lot, and uh, they haven't had that many <coughs> wins yet. but. Never mind. Um, I was delighted to hear the words of co-housing of co-housing and other different ways of building from our Minister of Housing, the Honourable Phil Twyford. So that was cool. He must have been listening in on our talks here. Um, and expanding on the urban reform, it was strongly advised to go up, not out. So that's um, Councillor Bunting loves that. And um, and, but, not, but it was actually said that not with big high-rise buildings, but with um, infill and um, lower-rise buildings, because high-rise buildings uh, in itself make another, um, just get the wrong people in again. It's not, not the, what we really want. And they also have to be close to public transport and amenities, otherwise they don't work properly. So that's, we're in agreement with that. Um, it is called compact land use. Who knew? There was also a strong theme that planners need to be more open to different ways of building. Um, they've actually written two books about planners and not um, being very open-minded, but it comes back to us as governance that we need to be open-minded too and being more broader thinking and not just doing the same old, same old. So, so we give the planners the chance to actually be open-minded as well and, and broader. And I think it's starting to happen in, in our council here, which is really, really cool. Um, the, the other one was just on the urban theme. It was mentioned that piping wastewater across the city to, to a large wastewater plant is not always the most efficient way. And again, we need to think of different ways to deal with wastewater, especially within new subdivisions. And on the environmental reform, the question that came out were that we are do 
are we doing enough for the environment? And that so um, is science is uncertain and everything is changing. So are we flexible enough to adjust? On fresh water, are we doing enough to clean up our river and our lakes? And we've, we've got that now, we're talking about that. And, um, and really, in the end, it all comes down to we need to keep promoting innovation and the use of the, the Resource Management Act and the district plan, using them as a guideline, not as a weapon or a wall to, be, uh, to hide behind. Thank, thank you. Well, you will circulate to council perhaps the link for the papers that came out of that? There'll be a website, won't there, for the papers? Um, yeah. Presentation, and that that's actually the way we ought to approach these uh, conferences. I don't know if I'm in order and mentioning it right now, but I think that was that was really useful. Yeah. No. Yeah. Thank you. And um, certainly, it is my intent to things that are on topic for community and services to mm. allow some um, where the time is available. It is really useful because yeah. you can have yeah. some debate. Um, I do think it's also important if you attend a conference that's on point that you mm. do share the, the talking points, which I have done here, and you've got all the links to the stuff that was discussed. But mm. it, you know, I think also there's an opportunity to do more in our updates, which is more of a, di a discussion around where we're heading with some of those key ideas. That's <coughs> something yeah. I would like to see improved as we go forward. And it kind of speaks to that, that sending people on, del you know, as delegates to these things, then it's, it, you know, you get value for your money. If it's yeah, you you've got to get your value for the money. It's yeah. got to feed into the work that yeah, we do. Yeah, but yeah. I think that some um, sort of more iterative workshops um, may be a solution to some of that stuff True. too. Okay, thank you. So my report has been moved and seconded, I understand, has it? Yeah, uh, all in favour? Well, no, I haven't. <laughs> I'm on the wrong tab. Okay, sorry, question. Just, just being helpful. Um, um, was what was the uh, great report <coughs> actually really interesting and, and particularly with regard to the as we expand and our growth mm. the technology around the wastewater water water conservation get that and very important. What which did we have staff attend that? So who would through the, to the GM who would be the the link point for for that? I the conference will publish its findings. Uh, who would that? The Lisa. Yeah. Who, who would be the link person in our team? Uh, yeah, I'm, probably Valisa Wright. So yeah, yeah. Did you want something? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying because obviously, because Councillor Henry's given us a really good summary, and just making sure that you know though the key bullet points, if you like, flow through to the, the relevant member of our. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 Okay, I'll make a note. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for attending that conference and reporting back to us. It's appreciated. All those in favour of the report say aye. Opposed? Carried. Which brings us now on to the next item, which is the community assistance policy on page 111. <laughs> Just, uh, I, I take the report as read. Uh, I would have, I emailed everybody a few days ago when the report went live, just in terms of the other applicants who applied to this uh, community event fund. Reminder that when we reviewed the community assistance policy late last year, one of the, the significant changes to the policy was the reintroduction of this community events fund, primarily to address the the growing number of community events coming through our single year community grants and a little bit of that feeling that actually we wanted to ring fence both our multi-year and single year grants for a little bit more of operational support and then provide another mechanism to support our larger uh, community events and so this is the mechanism. You'll notice that there was nearly $200,000 of request uh, from 47 applicants which you know, is part of uh, the regularity of funding, uh, but we have, uh, through the through Lance as the GM of community, uh, we have supported 21 events that will take place from now through until April next year. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Are there any questions, Councillor McPherson? Thanks, Andy. Um, I've got a couple um, in. There's two in the list on page 113 that appear to be run by churches, um, 
Community Link Trust and New Life Community Ministries. Are they events open to anyone from the public or are they just for that particular denomination? Uh, in particular, the Community Link Trust, that is a, a light party in slightly different of the Treats in the Park on the west hand side, but again, it's an open event uh, with the focus of not so much the ghouls and the Halloween costumes, but a moment for celebrating for those who might not want the ghouls and the, the, the witches. Uh, so it is an open event, uh, though the clientele may be uh, not fully everybody. In terms of the New Life Community Ministry, that is a, a partnership with the Night to Shine Ball is uh, an opportunity for some of our disability sector to really celebrate and have a ball. So it's a, an event that's done in partnership with lots of our, our disability sector and for those particular um, clients and family members of, of those organisations. So again, it is wide. Okay, that's good. Perhaps a um, little bit of an explanation because when we see a church running it in a church, it can be a bit misleading from your answers totally given me what I wanted mm -hmm. to know, but some sort of note there, and there's occasionally some other things, some sports things potentially could look like just um, running a regular sporting activity rather than a, a special thing, which yeah. I happen to know about, so I didn't need to ask about them, but yeah. others might have. Really open to ensuring that our reports are the most useful for mm. councillors. So uh, this is, a, I guess, a model that we've kind of done previously, but yeah. we can... Uh, because of the size of this event fund, uh, we could easily add a greater descriptor around what those events look like in future. The other question I had related to, when I looked at the declined, I noticed um, one or two environment ones up there that were declined. Um, and uh, while I don't want to comment on the individual ones, what I was concerned about was this fund has come about with the amalgamation of the old community <coughs> wellbeing fund and our own FIRO <coughs> fund some five years, six years ago. And it was stated at the time that there would be <coughs> the, the briefing to the committee would include environmental um, activities slash um, facilities, <coughs> services, whatever, that they would still get a look in. I and mean, I'm looking at this list here and the decline list. I'm not sure that they did get a look in this time. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good point, I guess. In terms of this, in our review of the community assistance policy in October, that was the, the second rendition of that, um, that policy that amalgamated all of those funds back in 2015. And very much the uh, environmental sector and our arts sector uh, are a part of the live conversation and the lenses that we use for our single and our multi-year. This particular event fund is a lot more similar to our old H3 um, and major events community element, which was that thousand participants and thinking about the breadth of events and the costing for participants. So some of the uh, those declined, uh, I guess what I'm saying there is that those metrics were a lot more of a um, a lens that we looked through, though taking into effect the environmental and the arts and the community, it was really a little bit more around that, um, the size of events and when, where. Don't know if that necessarily answers the question though, sir. Yeah, okay. I, and it may be, I suppose, that the applications you received from environmental groups weren't as community oriented as perhaps some of the others, I can imagine that. But do, do we work with the environmental groups in the community to make sure they're aware of what will fit and well and what won't fit so well? Absolutely. You know, um, Sandra's amazing in terms of her <coughs> community contact and spreading the word as far and wide and then responding to individual queries about how, do, how does my thing fit or not. Yeah. We're not big fans of making people do work just to be told no. Yeah. So we do put a lot of energy into making sure that organisations who apply have the best opportunity of getting a yes. Uh, this fund is a little bit smaller and yeah. I guess when we, if we split the 47 
a thousand each, it becomes less useful then. Yeah. So this one's a little bit more tricky than a single year and where we're able to kind of flex that a little bit bigger. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Oh, I would um, also, I was going to also ask about the environmental events and whether there's a, um, a proportion of the events that would go into the environmental sector or we just don't do it that way, but you're saying we don't do it that way. No, we, we, we use the lens of making sure that we have got lots of wide participation across our community, but we don't go <coughs> X percentage of our grant will go towards that sector. And so the challenge sometimes with using that lens is that we, we don't say yes to an application that's not a great fit. Mm. Uh, yeah, and whereas if we had a percentage, we would be saying yes to the best that's on the table within that sector. So the, the conversations that led to these decisions were very much around that whole of community. How do we benefit the most? And unfortunately, the environmental projects didn't get um, put forward for funding this, this round. This round. I, I would, oh, I suppose, say that, save that for the comment question uh, around <coughs> the um, churches, because I know we had conversation around ch churches of any sort, and that d that's just not the Christian churches, but all of the other um, denominations that might apply. Um, what is there in the way of criteria to, to ensure um, that... It's not just an event that is for their own congregation plus a few people who may be invited in, but it is actually having outreach or is, <clears throat> like you talked about, the night shine ball, and then when you said about the I thought, oh, yes, that's right, that's what that's all about. Um, how does that fit within the criteria? Because it's easier for me, and I think, to be, have confidence in the criteria than to um, rely on noticing something in the list and asking about it. Uh, so in the GM's report later on um, the agenda, there is just the community assistance policy being uh, put forward to update in light of the changed financials of the 10-year plan. But as part of that policy, Schedule 3, which is page 129, has the uh, criteria and guidelines that are used for this particular fund. You, you'll notice it's not it's not a lot of words and it's not a lot of um, you know, hoops to jump through. It is created to be accessible for our community. In terms of the application form, it asks a lot more detailed questions to ensure that those who are assessing it aren't left wondering those particular questions. But there is their genuine, what is the wide community participation? Who is this going to benefit? what's the track record within this. We had a couple of applications this year which sound great projects, but the fact that that never happened before <coughs> tempered some of those decisions around actually what was their request and their need versus other events that are well established and they can produce the um, figures from not only participants last year, but also what the actual costs were. And so those those things are all considered in the assessment of the, the detailed application forms that we, we ask for. And re um, <coughs> refresh me one further small question around the Christmas type events. Well, I see there's a, uh, a selection of them there, but none of them are in, well, I suppose there's the lake, that's the CBD, but none of them are in the garden place that was that because there was no application from the central city or does that sit somewhere else within that central city revitalization amount is that where you would see supposing there was going to be a carol concert around the tree or, or some such we didn't receive <coughs> from memory a particular but obviously through um council we've supported the christmas tree uh, which is a, a significant you know kind of part of that christmas mm. offering uh, and so that's a, an element of our grant as well. We, we had a couple of applications where H3 had supported in, in a way and we went, actually that's been funded by council and we're not going to double that funding up. So it was a bit of A in the sense that the application's meant for us, but also B, acknowledging that there were other community Christmas events that council has supported. Mm, okay, cool. Talking with HCBA, there will probably be a few smaller activations uh, as part of that 100,000. And also, you know, working with other community groups that don't necessarily need our, our grant fund, but might need um, staff support to, you know, make different things happen in our, in our central city. Councillor Bunting. Thank you, Anne. 
I just want to uh, and look at everyone's an expert on who should get the get the grants, I guess. But um, I just want to um, test you a little bit. Um, point thirteen uh, speaks towards a balanced portfolio, etc. And you know, no sport events at all uh, in this one. Three Christmas ones, etc. Is there a touch one there? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, my apologies. Is there? We're about yeah, halfway, um, down. halfway down the list in uh, January. Oh, try serious touch. Yeah. Oh yeah, big pardon. Okay, um, is, is, is this? Are you quite happy that this is reflective of the um, of the? Is there a soccer one? Uh, yep, the Refugee Orientation Centre Trust. So they've got the Jambo Ethnic Kids Soccer Festival. As part of uh, some of these applications, physical activity is definitely considered as part yeah. of the offerings. Okay. Uh, when we look at the portfolio of our 47, uh, again we're a little bit limited to who applies and, and how that fits. Uh, and so it's uh, it's a consideration, but we don't jam in uh, an inappropriate, what we would seem not the best grant yeah. use of our money. Yep. Do you have any dialogue with the likes of, um, now, was it uh, Waikato Hamil Hamilton Waikato Tourism who were here talking about events? And was it then that was talking earlier on about an events um, push, yeah. etc.? Are, are you in talks with them about where they're going with it and how we could tie in with them? Uh, we, I meet with Jason and Vanessa a little bit when we're talking central city stuff. Um, we haven't dialogued particularly around the community events that are associated with this grant and Jason. I'm seeing him later in the week so I yeah. can bring that up and make sure it's on, on my horizon. Yeah, not so much that they can help us but that we can feed this to them as well perhaps. Okay, that's an offline discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have... Receiving the report for voting. If there is no comment, I would like to just say perhaps it would be good. We've seen the policy, which is coming up shortly, but um, um, it might be worth uh, for councillors' interest a link to the form so that councillors who haven't been involved in an assessment process can see the form because it, you know that is the um, application of policy, really, isn't it? Just for, just for information and interest. Okay, thank you. We'll go to the vote, please. Oh, no, okay, I'll move. Seconded by Councillor Gallagher. All in favour? Done. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for the work. Thank you, Sandra, for the work you do and with all those groups behind the scenes. It's appreciated. And now what that brings us on to um, the Community Development Strategy Page 114. Debbie, thank you for your patience and waiting. Good afternoon. I'll take the report as read, but I um, do just want to add that the team are working really hard and it's been um, a really positive and engaging process for them to date. And any questions on it? Sorry, I haven't got the right tab open again. Oh, oops, oops. Councillor McPherson. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. Um, look, one particular point I want to pick up on was paragraph 19 on page 116. <coughs> Have the CD staff not actually moved to the building yet? Like, as of now, I'm not talking about when the report was written. No, so um, we're looking at a move um, early October. OK, so I'm going to recount a situation to you and ask you to comment on this. Um, six public car parks down the street car park have been reserved for council staff only. I rang the parking manager last week on Wednesday to ask him what was happening there because it was every other time that's happened that's been uh, run by council for, you know, if there's a change needed in there. And he was, he told and it was full of car parks, some with HCC vehicles on names on them, that the community development staff had shifted into the building and that was being used by them. And they, if you have a look at them now, they're full too. So they walked through there on the way up here. So they're not CD staff? Not currently. Not currently. OK, someone's telling porkies um, there, so I might ask the general manager to take that up unless he knows someone else doing it. Um, I was told that one of the other general managers had been advised of this, but um, I have a concern which I want to put to the general manager, not maybe for answering now, but to get sorted, 
Those car parks were public car parks earning council uh, revenue because they're off street. Um, and I actually got alert to it because I got a complaint from the member of the public who couldn't find where to pay. Um, and I tried to help him find it either. Um, so how has that come about without being run by council? One. And two, the strategy of putting staff into car parks in the city centre actually potentially runs counter to one of the things we looked at in the um, workshop the other day, which was the car share idea, where there was a thought that um, some of those car parks might be... Okay, so we're getting in a little bit into debate here. Yeah, so, but, but it, it's come up because staff are being given car parks like that, yeah. and so A, it shouldn't happen. So we need some clarity around... If there's situation. a process whereby you decide those things, and this it definitely hasn't followed that, and see it's not happening the way... So the question is, can we have an update on what's happening around the parking spaces? Not necessarily today, because we also got um, um, a request to look into it from volunteering in Waikato as well. So can this be something that we can do and get a satisfactory um, yeah. process and response to Council, please? So the answer is yes, that's happening at the moment, and I think um, Councillor Davis brought up a good point, and there's been some emails mm. coming around and that sort of thing. So Eva Lees is looking into it. Just about the pro look, my view is the process probably hasn't been particularly good. I think you've you've brought up a a, a good point. Um, the first bit about um, uh, car parks that we earn revenue off and coming to council, I, I'm I'm not sure what the policies are, but um, I've actually asked. Last week, I asked Eva Lisa to look into that too. Um, the thing which probably concerned me was probably um, the limited consultation or um, discussions with volunteering Waikato and others. And in the third third bit is um, what you mentioned around uh, staff car parks and that sort of thing. Um, so about we have car parks, where are they appropriately located and that sort of thing. So we're happy to bring back a full report on that. Um, I know Eva lisa has got Emily looking into it, just to make sure that um, we give you the full picture on what's happened and what should have happened and what shouldn't have happened and where can we go from here. And whether the uh, current signage down there is actually legal, because there has to be council resolution is my understanding, and there has been none. So the process as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. And Can one of them has been knocked down anyway by someone. So we're on to that. To you. Uh, I figured you'd bring it up yeah. today. So, um, so so that's underway, so we'll get a we'll get a report coming back to councillors as soon as possible. Thanks. Um, next questions? Yep, uh, Councillor Kalaha. I'm not. Can we just check if you know what information we as elected members got? I know there's a delegate. I was certainly uh, buttonholed correctly by a member of volunteer Waikato. Even I myself was reading the signs, had no idea what was going on. That may not be necessarily unusual in that case. Um, it was. It was a very much a, a you know, and it just yeah. So, so I'm really question, heartened. Question. 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 No, I think it's important, Madam Chair, because this. I think with respect, we have incurred some embarrassment. Uh, I'm not here to, to judge the process, but I really will be, um, given it's a delegated matter, if we have any learnings about this uh, oh, sorry, in future. It's not a delegated matter. That's the problem. Okay, uh, so, so look, yeah. so, um, I think I'm going to... I'll take, I'm take going the point about learnings. Um, yeah. My understanding there was you up. some information executive update last week or the week before. Okay, I'm um, going to stop this further debate. No. I think what but we have got is an no, no, no. Yeah. what we've got is an assurance that you will look into the process and what happened yep. and what can happen and come back to council. And I think that will address the questions and concerns that both Councillor McPherson and Councillor Gallagher have raised. So um, I would like to just raise another question. I notice we've got a workshop on the 27th of September, which is exciting. So the um, recommendations, such as the ones on page 119 around um, community-led processes and identifying strategies and tying them to roles and or to neighbourhood areas. That will be something that you will welcome our feedback on in that 27th of September workshop, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, perfect. So, all right, um, will someone please move that the report, Councillor Bunting, Councillor Hamilton, any further debate, discussion? Councillor Gallagher? Well, um, obviously received the report and 
as we've already um, acknowledged um, uh, the, the role of Dr. Gatenby, and that I just, and this is not in any way provocative. And actually, there's no elected member that was here <laughs> at the, well, because there was a time when there was even a debate whether community development uh, would carry on as a group in this council. Um, so I'm really delighted we've we've moved. Uh, 100 years, is that right? That's the new thing. 100 years beyond that concept. That's 100 years ago. That's good. Um, I'm really looking forward in terms of physical location, and I know that the team doesn't just sit in an office all day, but I'm really looking forward to the calibration, if you like, of proper location, but very much. Um, <clears throat> I was out at the uh, you know, Western Community Centre at the community network that day, particularly Ziggy, uh, especially from the west, uh, Paula was there attend, uh, and and I just want to underscore, and it was wonderful to meet a member of the new new member of the team, but I want to underscore that community outreach network's not the only place where they work, but but we shouldn't underestimate the, this crucial significance of them, you know, being out and about and and doing great work. But as I said, it was 100 years ago when we were even questioning the future of this department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to, um, we've had it moved. Did I? Did I move it second? Yeah, we did move from a second. Thank you to the staff for all the work you've done. And uh, also we note our thanks to Bev for her work um, around it. I know there's a lot of energy in the community development team around this. And so we're really excited to see what can come out of it. So all in favor, opposed, carried. Thank you. Which brings us to our lucky last, which is your general manager report, Lance, on page 122. Thanks, Councillor Paula. Um, I'll get uh, the team to, um, if there's any questions about Kiri Kiri Rose Slip, uh, Maria can answer those. Um, I'll get Andy to talk about the community assistance policy. Lisa's here to talk about the funding applications. Um, Debbie and I and the chair can talk about the discussion with Waikato District Council about the libraries matter and the Kaute Pacifica part. Um, we don't need to discuss that anymore after the decision this morning. So if I'm um, happy to answer any questions on the Kiri Kiri Rose slip. Maria, do you want to pop down if there's any questions? Thanks. I do have a small question about that on, off the back of the conversation that we had around the Tehekawai slip. So uh, now that we have the engineer's report and cost, um, will that be something that council also considers in terms of that wider debate that we had around the affordability of reinstating slips? This is another one. There will be another one. Without doubt, there'll be more than another one. So that whole big picture about um, resilience and risk um, so, yes, um, Madam Chair, we will be working with Cal Chris Allen's team to um, bring a workshop together so that we can all discuss that level of risk and what we're comfortable with. Um, the Kitty Kitty Rye Slip has some added complexity because um, it's a significant engineering um, mm. feat and um, we need to understand the impact on the financial strategy in terms of the fact that we have no headroom and um, are we working again with Chris Allen and his team to understand that before the report comes forward? All right, thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there's any value, Lance, at some stage when we had this all together, was um, <clears throat> doing some communications with the public through one means or another, because I don't think they necessarily always understand the um, underlying environment of our river riparian margins and, and the risk that it pre presents. <laughs> And then, of course, we do get quite a bit, as we did with Tehekawai, we got a lot of public, I did anyway, because I live up sort of in that area, I guess, um, a lot of public reaction to why does it take so long path back and things like that. So I do think there's a, a little bit of um, potentially of um, helpful communication around what we do do to um, manage erosion and stability of our walkways. And yeah, it's a good point, and Jeff's sitting here from Com, so... Um I think in the past when we had the Bryce Street slip, there was quite a bit of mm. dialogue in the 
especially in the Waikato times around the complexity of the, you know the river pathway network and the environment that it's located in. Um, so that's something we could um, probably get some good messaging around so that people understand that um, you know it is it is a difficult area to work in and and probably a learning from some of the <coughs> other experiences is um, around signage, getting appropriate signage up that's current, um, gives people updates, you know, even if it's just call flute signs and things like that. Um, so if someone rocks up, they actually know what's going on or what isn't going on and that sort of thing. So um, and we can uh, we can do better on that. We don't have the paper version of City News, but obviously throughout all of our electronic media, media statements, because it you know, came up with Leo, uh, well, you know, was raising correctly about the Allendale, just, just with that, because this is now sort of moved into a long-term um, phase. Important as part of our branding of the river plan is important. Uh, I have a question on the library, but is that, do I take that separately? Uh, yep, it's part of the report. So oh, I might, okay. I might just get Andy, if there's no more questions on slips, I might just get Andy to pop up around the commu Any community more assistance policy. Any slip? No. Yep, so libraries now. No, we're getting there. We we'll, do, we'll do community assistance policy first. We've kind of gone through the meeting. Us are just preempting that because we've just kind of had a conversation. Any questions around the community assistance policy? So that's just the just with the adjustment around our LTP funding, so pretty much. And one little tweak, is that right, Andy, in point 15? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, that we don't fund groups to then um, pay money back to council. Yeah. yeah, and that's in following up our single year grant conversation that we've had um, in this committee uh, in the last couple of months. Yep. We had a good conversation about that. Councillor McPherson, are you just for libraries still, or this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any questions on the community? Yeah, any questions on the community assistance? So Answers point thirteen. Is that right? The um, during the allocation process, uh, twelve organisations received funding for projects that included amounts that will be returned to council through fees and charges for using council facilities. Yeah, and I think w when we discuss um, this at, uh, briefing, I think some elected members just a bit concerned that we might give a grant to a community group and then they are paying it back to council for something else. So it's yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of like we're paying ourselves indirectly. So yep. so we've just qualified that. OK. That's thank clear. You. Thank you. So um, funding applications we've um, discussed. Are there any questions around the funding applications? Oh, so Lisa, Lisa's here just to give a bit of an update. This is really just to get on the front foot to, um, to be able to um, put some applications into Trust Waikato and Well Energy. Oh, OK. Um, and we can also say we've had some really good news on the Tourism Infrastructure Fund. We've actually received, what is it, Lisa, $220,000 for the of Hamilton Gardens. Just been announced and the Minister's announcing that all as we speak, apparently. Well done. Congratulations to you for your work on that. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the good news. The bad, news, the the bad news is we don't get any money right. for the river plan. Yes. No, unfortunately. Um, so, but at least we got something for the gardens, which is good. So, yeah. Mm. Um, okay. Any other key comments you would like to make for this part uh, of the report? The only update is uh, since the report um, was written, uh, item uh, item or oh, item in twenty one. Um, we've had conversations with the funders, and they've indicated that there's going to be little or no impact on future applications, particularly to any significant funds in the future. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good then. Yes, yeah. it's a fresh seat every time. Absolutely. Okay. No questions on that. Yep. You, yes, Councillor Hamilton. Sorry, oh, Councillor Mallet. Sorry. No, but sorry, I think it's Dave's ahead of me too. Oh, no, no, we go, we're going through. Um, Lance preferred to go through the um, item sequentially. Oh, OK. All right, sorry. So, so we're just taking questions only about the funding applications at this point. OK, and it's just a query on the cost of the toilet. I mean, I think it has been raised before. But how, how does a toilet get to be over $100,000? A toilet block, I appreciate, all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, so it's, it's a whole block of toilet. Yep. So, so but you could, build a, you could build a cheap house for that. 
Okay, so yeah. let, let's have a response. Yes, you could. Not, not, the land, stage, not the land, but... Um... At this stage, they are cost estimates. So there are toilet facilities as well as pathways and a small courtyard to connect yeah. from the gardens to yeah, the toilet so facilities. Sort of yeah. So it's down the back end of um, where the new developments are, over where the Mansfield Gardens is. So there's um, some drain laying on that sort of yeah. thing. So 200 grand for um, toilet block like that with all the... Uh, Services and that sort of thing is um, probably bronze plated. Okay. Not, oh, yeah. not, toilets are not cheap, no. especially if you make them bomb proof. It's not, it's not just mm. one of those little electronic toilets, it's a block and all the facilities around it. Use time. Anyway, your question is. So that includes the, the path to it and all that sort of stuff, does it? The path to okay. it, the courtyard in front, you said, Lance? Yeah. Okay, cool. Can That's we? Been... Okay, so it's right. Uh, offline, I wouldn't mind seeing the costs and what makes it up and all that sort of stuff. Thank yep. you. Peter C will be more than happy to show you. Excellent. You do that. Um, okay, any questions on the libraries? Okay, so let's go. I've got Councillor Gallagher, who was actually first, and then I'll go down the list. Oh, sorry. Still on a funding question. There. Oh, are you? Sorry. This is the trouble with looking at the board and going off it. So, Councillor. So, Councillor apologies. Dave's upset the apple cat there, I think. <laughs> well, this library's arrangement. It's no, okay, no. it's okay. I'm okay. just joking. <laughs> <laughs> right, come on, carry on. We're talking funding um, applications. The TIFF. Okay, so the river plan has mm. been... Is that, is that a yes, no, or maybe, or is that a definite no? The application we submitted has been unsuccessful. Do they give you any feedback? Um, the feedback provided, and we will... Um, circulate the letters provided. We're just waiting for the announcement by the Minister. Um, but they felt, well, first of all, there was 11 million in the, in the fund give out. The river plan was three and a half, almost three and a half that we applied for. So it was a significant chunk of money. But um, they did indicate that the Hamilton Gardens one was a stronger fit based on the criteria of meeting current demand and constraints right now. That's not to say that any future rounds, we could not um, look to um, applying for those projects again. And, and it's true, isn't it, that there's likely to be changes to the criteria because they've changed every round thus exactly. far. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, now we truly are on to questions around the library and, and Councillor Gallagher has been waiting. The, the two issues, one is the, the discussion around the, the library's contract versus, you know, the regional library service. Just first of all, on the contract, are the Waikato District Council staff negotiators aware of the elected members' feeling on this, right from the Mayor who's at, not with us today, his heart is so cold it's on ice freeze. Most of us have very cold hearts on this. I mean, I, I think with an open mind, <coughs> we believe with an open mind, they, they had the deal of the century, which they did. Have they got an idea that probably there's not much movements without pre, pre, prejudging? If you like, I'll, because I was the other, the other politician sorry, sorry, in, the, yeah. in the room, I can respond to that meeting and what their yeah, expectations sure. Could were. Could you tell us, Madam Chair? Um, so the purpose of that meeting was to, to first of all, uh, get a common understanding around the data that had been supplied mm. to them, some of which hadn't originally mm. been supplied to their mm. governors, and just make sure that we were reading and then applying criteria to the data in the same way. So I think the good thing about that meeting is at the end, we all were quite clear on what the spreadsheet and the usage of the library and everything was telling us. So that was, was, um, was useful in itself. Um, because that we haven't been certain that we've been looking at the same data, apparently. So then out of that, um, we had a, a talk about, in philosophical talk, that they would like to come back to the table, potentially, and that if we got an uh, agreement, well, it's win-win. We get what we wanted out of it, and they were able to meet us, that that would be a good end. Uh, having said that, they were going to look at um, how to, to put a zone around uh, their membership, if you want, who could be in and who could be out from their ratepayers' point of view, which is work that we fully agreed was got nothing to do with <coughs> us, it's up to them. 
and they were going to go back to their council through their deputy mayor and have a conversation to see if we could have come closer but somewhere between the 200 that they proposed and the 300 that we wanted. Now, I wasn't prepared to, to um, commit to any outcome and nobody else was either. So it was up to them where we left it was they were to go back to their council. And I understand that, that they are doing that. They just haven't found a time of all of their council to get over this. And so it's potentially nothing's going to happen or it could be that at some stage they come with a deal. But I'm not hopeful of that at this time. So are they aware that um, I have an open mind at 299.99 cents? I have a closed mind, I think, <laughs> at 200. Uh, no. Are they aware that the, 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 the hearts around this chamber, I think, are cold look, in the, terms look, of the, the, mayor was in the lower amount? The Mayor was in the meeting and he <coughs> made his view on that quite clear. Um, having said that, when a partner um, council comes and wants to have an open conversation with them, mm. I believe you have an open conversation in goodwill good faith that there might be a solution and that's what that's the approach we took was are you aware that the residents of Tamahiri are working out that the bulk of their rate money goes towards two account Pocono and not their own area well, that's or the none city? of my business business and it wasn't uh, discussed on the okay day. the next question thank you madam chair the next question to the general manager um, is about the regional service and I just in this question I have a caution because while I want a regional service, you know, I, I can see the merit and serious discussion of regional service. I, I have a, I have a focus that this must be to the absolute benefit of Hamilton ratepayers because of the scale we have versus the other libraries. I'm not opposed to it, but just, just perhaps could you update us as to where the thinking is is, is going in that area? Um, so. And Debbie will correct me if I'm wrong, the Waikato District Council engaged a, a consultant to start looking at um, initial feasibility around that and what would it mean. I, 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 we've made it very clear that the, the costs and benefits and um, proportion of who would pay what um, need to be, uh, in any next phase, need to be carefully looked at and um, that uh, there, need to, there needs to be benefits to all parties in, in, a, um, in any cross-boundary type of um, library service that might work. Now, there's, there's, there's also uh, there's a number of models for that. There's the full-blown integrated library service. Um, there's sort of some hybrids of that um, with different nuances to those. Um, so it's still got to chug through uh, um, a bit more work. Um, we're inputting into that, but I think uh, a key part of that will be doing the financial analysis around, you know, the setup costs, um, uh, what are expectations of various councils in the inner Waikato around that. I think we need to lay that on the table pretty clearly and, and ensuring that there's equity in, in any... Um, shared service that goes forward. Could, could um, you remind, sorry, goes forward. I apologise. Could you remind us which TAs are part of the discussion? Uh, because our, our hands are a little bit burnt with our good friends in Waipa on water. So I just want to get a sense of, you know, in other words, we're investing. Um, please, I want this. You know, I think we've got to have an open mind about the proposal. It looks promising, but kind of just getting a sense where, where which councillors are seriously in and 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 whether it's a two-way deal or three, four? So the discussions haven't got to that point yet in terms yeah. of who's in, but in terms of who is participating in the workshops, it's actually all of the councils within the Waikato region. So yeah. that goes right down to Taupo and includes Bay of Plenty. So it's at this stage, it's a very broad and wide discussion. And it might be, if we talk about a hybrid, it might even be going over. It might even just be sharing of expertise of, of you know the kind of a relationship, cooperation, memorandum of understanding about shared. You know, my Hamilton card might get me to somewhere else as well. Uh, is that the sort of kind of thing we're also looking at? So they're looking at a whole range of different options to mm. the one, you know, from the one card model to the shared collection to um, whether you can. Um, get some cost effectiveness by sharing training and expertise. Libraries, yeah. one heritage collection right. that services the whole region. So there's a whole a whole range of different possibilities that they're looking into at the moment. So obviously, from our governor's reporting point of view, you're anticipating potentially 
uh, fairly obviously a very detailed update a as you progress in terms of the different models that are being discussed. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McPherson. So following the extremely wide-ranging canvassing of, uh, and questions from the member for Tamahiri over there, um, <laughs> could I uh, ask uh, whether the elected members from the Waikato district who were present at this meeting on the 27th were aware that they had, were all present um, when they received a submission from this council which had all the, our statistics on the library usage by Waikato district residents. We were very aware of what they received. Um, and actually it wasn't a meeting of elected members and staff quite the way it reads there. It was um, a request of me from, from a member through their mayor. And so it was Mayor Andrew and myself, the, um, uh, the councillor for Tamahere from Waikato district and, and me, that was it. It wasn't intended okay. to incorporate, incorporate everyone, it was no, just no, a sort no. of... No, I know the yeah. ones that were there, um, I, and I know they were all present when they received Yes, I know, submission. but there were some parts of the um, information that they felt they hadn't received or hadn't understood at the time. And so, look, you know, part of the reason, as I say, the large part of it was to have the information across the table in the same room and say, are we reading this the same way? And I think that well, was well, incredibly Well, uh, sorry, useful. I was actually asking staff... Um, there because yep. uh, staff prepared that submission and present when it was pre presented to their their LTP hearings and they all had the opportunity every single one of them that were present at this other meeting mm -hmm. at, the, at the earlier meeting before they made a decision they all had the opportunity to question on any detail or query any points that they didn't understand then and they were in fact in the same room across a table literally at that mm -hmm. same time so I'm trying to find out whether um, any of them bothered to read the submission or um, have query anything at the time, and whether they queried anything of their staff. Uh, my impression, just going on from what Paula said, is that um, some of their elected members may not have understood uh, the information, or that's what it appeared like, um, but uh, we did confirm that the the information that we looked at at this meeting outlined in the agenda item uh, was the information that had been given to Waikato District um, prior um, to their deliberations around their LTP and you and Rebecca going to present um, on the submission. So um, I've, my view, there's a bit of a philosophical difference around um, uh, the way that any contract should and I think that came out in discussions. The one other thing I just want to highlight is that we actually have a resolution on the books from this council as well around yeah. um, that we were to offer $300,000 um, for the current, the current type of service. And that's re the live resolution that's still on our books. Yeah. Um, in 24, thanks for that, <coughs> Lance. Paragraph 24, it's reference to a smaller geographical area being looked at. Was that discussed or scoped? Be, and the reason I'm asking that is, be, and it's a discussion that's been held here at this council before, there was a proposal in, several years ago for a, a the Tamahiris and Gordontons and Takofis of the world, but not the Raglans and um, Narawahias, for instance, the further out townships. Um, mm. Was it sort of defined in any way like that? Because a very strong point was made on behalf of Raglan residents who work in Hamilton, which is where most Raglan residents who work have jobs that they can't access Waikato District Library services um, most of the time because they're in Hamilton when the library out there is open and when they're out there the library's not open. So mm. that was a strong point made at that time. Yeah, and that's a point we've made um, over the last couple of years to be honest around um, think for people at Waikato District in to think that through carefully, it's all right to come up with postal code areas of people who might be physically um, immediately adjacent to Hamilton city boundaries, like I live in Fodda Fodda, you know, far out of town. Um, but I'm not going to drive to Narawahia to go to the library because I work in town and I'm just going to walk across there. Yeah. Um, so, so we made that point. Um, that's what they've gone away to have a look at to make sure that 
Um, really what uh, their councillor and Deputy Mayor were saying that um, they wanted to come back to us um, something that's, um, that would work and is more pragmatic. Um, handing out these vouchers at the moment has um, ended up being quite confusing for people. I know down my road, I, didn't, I got a letter saying I don't get a voucher because I'm not an active user, um, but uh, a neighbour of mine does because he's been to the library once in the last 12 months. So quite confusing for people. <laughs> now, okay, any other so, questions? Yeah, I did. Yep. Um, just in terms of 25, the proposal we present to elected members for consideration, was that discussed that that would have to be at the annual plan discussion time next year, if we're being asked no. to potentially vary our annual plan? No, it wasn't. It, we just left it fairly open. It was for them, we um, left it for them to, uh, if it's, accept they don't even know if they've got buy-in of all of their councillors at this stage, Councillor McPherson. It was for them to consider the information that was exchanged at that meeting, see where that took them, and if there were to be any geographic area or anything else, that like the, one, the good points that you've raised there, um, it was for them to do the work to bring it to us, not for us to do any further work on it from this end. And, and just to, sorry, just yeah. to finish off, um, also that we would have to look at this end. We have got a live resolution on the books and that we would have to look at what, yeah, what would that. be the process at this end. At, um, and look, I need to talk to Leanne more about this. It may, it may well be a notice of motion. Um, I'll just sort of, um, I know the Chief Executive can bring something back <coughs> within six months of a resolution of council um, if there's new information. Uh, and I've just been querying Leanne and the team on, would this be new information? I'm not sure if it is, but um, so we'd have to think that through if we receive a proposal from them. And just on the regional, or it seems like multi-regional look now, the Bay of Plenty as well, isn't it best now that they've told us to um, F off, shall we say, that we have a look at the big regional picture? Dispelt with just one word, one letter F. No, um, come on, councillors. Uh, um, is it not better that we, I'm asking the GM or Debbie, that, that look at what the whole regional thing might become rather than picking off one or two little, I mean, they, they caused the situation and they, at the same time they asked us for a regional look, we agreed, but when's that coming back? Is that a better way to handle the whole issue? Yeah, so, that, so that's where we've been heading is, and like Debbie, the whole of the <coughs> different libraries from the Waikato region are actually involved and, and we actually think that's probably the best way to go. There, there might be, just for geographic you know, reasons and that sort of thing, there might be, um, and we've got an open mind on this, there might be a, like an inner Waikato um, joint library service in the future. So this, this, this study is actually having a look at those things and it will give some comment on that and say, well, maybe you're better off going down, investigating down this track rather than these other four tracks. So it'll be a bit of a filtering system. So but when, when does that back? Debbie? I believe it's due back um, in November, but I'd have to check. I'll let you know. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, I just picked up, you know, obviously, Lance, point you made about the sort of voucher. At the moment, you know, people who, and you're all obviously, notwithstanding my job before, you're all Hamiltonians, and you will be eventually Hamilton when we <laughs> move the boundary, but in terms of community of interest, no, really, really interesting. What could we just, could you remind us, and I think we need to remind ourselves what deal they're getting now and who is actually covered by the, the current contract? Because it seems a really good deal. So the, so the contract has expired, there is no... No, no, but the previous, the immediate previous contract that the, the they all unanimously, with no opposition, I understood, agreed to accept a staff recommendation to terminate the contract. Correct. You know, I mean that's that's a fact. Well, they can't. No, they did come to us and say that said that they wanted us to reduce the amount. If you remember, and we said no, and we said no. Councillors upheld that recommendation to cease those services. Correct. Right. Thank you. Very important. So, just can you just remind us what under the previous contract was on? You know, was being provided. Who was being advantaged? Affected. Um, well, so pretty much all residents within that Waikato district territory were allowed What's free... What's the territory? Can you just remind us? Well, it's from the Bombay Hills. You in, mean if I the, lived in, in Tuakau and I'm passing through Hamilton, 
I could, if I was a regular visitor worker here or, or came for trips, I could access a card? Correct. What but a deal. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. no, no, I mean, this is really, I mean, all I'm, I'm what the, the, the tenor of my questioning is for us as a council to reflect on what I would <coughs> consider a very generous arrangement. Well, that, that's debate, but great, thank you. So we've had all so, our so questions. Was the proposal for that to carry on? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's the easiest thing for us administratively and in terms also of compliance. It's the it's um you know the highest level of service that they could receive. Okay, so we're starting to get into questions masquerading as debate, but that's okay. Uh, we will. Uh, it's for information, and thank you for those questions. Um, are there any questions on the Cote? No, we don't need to because that's been. Yep, yep, absolutely, in a minute. Um, we don't need to worry about Cote Pacifica because that was already done with the previous decision. So the motion is to re receive the report, recommends the council improve the updated assistance policy, so that's a decision, and approves the funding application. So this is not a Receive the report, it's got bits in it. So have I got a mover, please? Councillor Gallagher, seconder, Councillor Bunting. All right, now we will go into debate. And in terms of debating on the um, library matter, well, I would prefer it if we didn't get overly um, duplicates that have, points that have already been made. And as a mover of the motion, I may or may not exercise my right of reply. Sure. Unlikely. But uh, standing orders would allow me that privilege. No, very seriously, I think, first of all, can I just talk about the um, funding applications, and that is good. And obviously, with regard to the river plan, obviously, we'll be interested in, in the criteria, what more we need to do to calibrate. That's really good news uh, in terms of a significant convenience and facility uh, f you know, for part of our international um, gardens, and that's, that's congratulations uh, to the team and obviously the ongoing relationships uh, with, with the funders and MPs and that is, is really uh, important. Also, can I say when I talk about the library's contract, uh, I mean no disrespect personally to the excellent Mayor for Waikato, great leadership uh, in terms of, and, and I acknowledge the pressures they're under, but what this high, high That's quite different from what you said before about that person. No, I didn't. <laughs> I've never criticised that person. As other mayors, I might have been less Charitable, okay, let's just stick to anyway, the issue on the record, hand, on the record, I understand totally the pressures uh, that Waikato District is under, and I understand how crucial a relationship with them is, is really important. But I do think what this library uh, contract disagreement, which they unanimously voted to um, turn down our the status quo, uh, which is an unusual move for that council to, to deprive their ratepayers of, of the deal of the century, in my view. It exposes the whole area of uh, what service the city, of course, is providing to a whole lot of people, particularly on their immediate fringe. And if you look at it, gee, for 300 grand, they're not getting just that, they're getting the subsidised access to the pools, to the zoo, to green space, all of the other facilities, frankly, uh, that we pay for as ratepayers, and they have free access to gardens. So I, I find it most unusual with respect that the Waikato District Council and the councillors didn't take the bigger pitch and say for 300 grand, actually we're getting a really good deal, super deal. If you say living in um, Pocono and you're working in Hamilton from time to time, I would have thought for the price that is flexible and really great. And of course we'll be discussing this further and, and I think it's been helpful in Tamahiri because people start to work out. I certainly wouldn't go in on their local newsletter page, which a certain colleague did. I'm not that, um, you know, don't believe in interfering with their internal affairs, but it does highlight the fact that it's the frank discussion we have to have respectfully to the people who live on our boundaries. In point of fact, a lot of their rates are in reality going somewhere in another part of their, of their district and not uh, benefiting them directly. The, with regard to the regional library service, uh, I'm looking forward to that process because really what um, you've very hopefully articulated is that there are many different models of that that could be of great gain for us. 
However, I do want to sort of ask the GM to, and the staff team to be con constantly aware as to the level of seriousness of the other participants. And we are burnt by the fact that we spent a million dollars, or how much did we spend on the waters? And we really need to suss out if a particular TA is serious and not just having a bit of a, a loose chat with us. And it seems to me we need to move to that sooner, you know, rather than later, because there's a lot of time, waste and energy on that. And it could very well be that um, it's, it's a trimmed down version or not. So that's the only thing I would say, but I do look forward um, to that report, which I think the exercise is, is generally very, very useful. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Um, Councillor Mallett. Thank you very much. Um, there is a solution to all that Councillor Gallagher um, preaches. It's a very, very simple pr uh, solution, but he will run a million, million miles away from it. It's called user pays, but don't even think he'll consider that. So I've got a question just how serious he is about this sort of stuff. OK, secondly, um, I can't support this because I, through the 10-year plan uh, process, I'm pretty sure I didn't vote for the 10 year, the uh, increase in community assistance uh, policy. Other than that, I'm reasonably comfortable with everything else that's in there. Um, yeah, but I won't be uh, supporting it for that reason. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Um, yes, uh, look, I can't let this opportunity slip. If you'll pardon the pun without having a, another quick crack at the, uh, the, the slip idea, I just want to take this opportunity that while we've got another slip that we're looking at um, to slip in, that we all be looking in the next annual plan at budgeting ahead for this and doing something really proactive about it. Um, I wish you luck, um, Lisa and team, with the, uh, the funding. Go hard. Uh, anything we can do to help, let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I add my vote of thanks to the staff for the work that you've done. And thank you, Debbie, for attending that library meeting because it was a free and frank discussion. So it was very... And that's what you do when someone approaches you for a discussion, you have one. And so it was very useful and I appreciate the staff support of that. And uh, really excited about the news for the, um, the <coughs> toilet at the gardens, because I think uh, as the garden, we definitely do need uh, another one. Another one. And um, yeah, so, and, and the community grants, it looks like looking down the list, that there's no shortage of good things going on. Um, there's a, a limit to our resource to help with those good things going on. It's always going to come down to which is the priority at the end of the day. But when you look down that list, apart from the comments that I think Dave makes very well around the environmental focus, which I think is something to keep a watching brief on, um, there's a range there of things that people can get involved in, and that's good for our community. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll go to the vote. It's, um, it's been moved and been seconded. We'll use the board for this one because it's, it's a proper decision. Okay. The motion is carried. Eight, four, one against. And thank you very much for a very interactive um, meeting. Thank you.